Welcome to Zero Page Homebrew, wow. your best source for the newest Atari games. And we do have a new Atari game today for the Atari 7800. I'm just going to keep that up because most of the games we're playing today are 7800. A couple 2600. But more importantly, we have Todd Fermansky in a developer spotlight where we're going to run through all of his games. Woohoo! And Darcy's going to play them. And Woo! I'm going to talk to Todd. <laughs> Darcy's very excited, as you can tell. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, we'll have him on. And then, at the end, we're going to play his brand new Atari 7800 game, world premiere of Harpy's Curse. Darcy's going to play it first. First person in the world, besides Todd. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to do awesome at it. Yes. Yes. Definitely, I will do awesome. Um, so, yeah. So we're going to have uh, Todd on in a couple seconds. But first, I'm going to read out all the Twitch subscribers scrolling down beside Darcy. Al the Fur Arena Foot, Arkham H7, Arc, Ar Armscar Coder, Atari 800 XL Rules, Atari 1974, Atari H, Atari Patch Quest, BR Poker, Buck, Owens, Captain Man 2D, Charles Donnie Mao, Charles and Check, Charles Wynn, Chick Gamer, Sheik Gamer, Colonel Lama, Cubanismo, Dianoid, Dan of C, Drexel, Dr. Moo, Cows, Emmy Dan, Gopher Man, Great Offender, Ground Trooper, Johnny WC, Carl G, Ken Jennings, Invader, Lambda Express, Lord GDZ, Mark Yannis, Mark Spazing, Mental Atari, McMuse, Mike Soul, Michael Town, Miss Command, MK Smith, Mr. Zunderwood, Mr. Fix, Mighty Funster, Nathan Strummel, Nostalgic, Pack Rat, Fokohog, R. Anschwitz, RC70, Ronnie Ghost, Brent, Let's Feed You, Ricardo Pims, Ward Castler, Six Sweet, Smitty B, Spice, Warass, Ramirez, The D Train, The Lost Cartridge, Welshman, Thrust, Tiki Dan K, T Foes, TM Events, Trek MD, 2600, X Ken X, and if you want your name on that X extensive list. You can. Just hit subscribe and uh, it's free if you have Amazon Prime's little checkbox. And if that sounds like a long list, it is because it's the longest list we've ever had. So many people supporting the show. Thank you so much. I guess you like what uh, uh, Darcy and I and Tanya are doing. Ding! Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> You're pushing the, pushing the list up as it goes. Darcy's, Darcy helped. I'm helping. <laughs> Uh, we have, um, a box to open. Let's open that box. See okay, I think it's got enough momentum now. It's got its own momentum? Yep. It's moving? Excellent. Uh, let's see. How am I going to open that? There we go. The cats are particularly excited today. Probably because Todd's on. What do you think? Yeah, or because Darcy's it. here. Mm. Or it could just be treats. Just pure, straight up treats. Yeah. So they may have been purchased. <laughs> Bought off by treats. Their, their excitement their may have been purchased, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mad Beagle Aerola Soft. Welcome to the live stream. Ooh, what is in this box? What is it? What could be wrapped in this plastic? I know what it is. Oh. <laughs> Acting. Yes. Acting. <laughs> what was that from? It's from Extras? SNL. I think it's now. No, it was from uh, acting. Maybe it was from both. It was. It was from extras. It was. Yeah, but I think. It, I think it was from SNL, vintage SNL, uh, like long before extras. Oh, I could okay. be wrong. Feel free to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> I know it from extras. It is the Retro Game Boys, ColecoVision. Uh, arcade joystick. Wow. This is... That's awesome. Number one. Oh. The first one ever made and sent out. It even says zero page on it. Uh, I'm going to go to the cat cam so you guys can see it. If we look like secret agents is because we have um, things in our ears to hear Todd. Mm. Let me go to the cat cam. It's not... It's certainly not that we're secret agents. No, we're not. There you go. It's got all the buttons, two buttons, it's got the keys, and we'll put on yeah, the key wall. Keep that upright. Because if I have it upside down, it's going to rub off. And why not have my name uh, showing? Or the show's name, that's not my name. There we go. I guess there's some instructions in there. There we go. It was John Lovett's SNL. Ah, okay. Darcy is correct, and that is before... Every once in a while I'm right about something. <laughs> so, there we go. And this is going to be handy, because we're going to do a ColecoVision stream. 
uh, very, very soon. Probably after we get back from PRG, because all the uh, shows are already taken up now uh, by very exciting things, which we'll talk about at the end of the show. Oh, Not start playing with it's it. It's 3D Play printed, it but it's like really... Hmm? It's like 3D printed, but it's like really nice. Yeah, it's very smooth. He may mm -hmm. sand it down after, right? It doesn't look sanded. No, it's really smooth. It's just it's like still really got high ridges. resolution or something. Yeah, 3D printers are getting better and better. Yeah, yeah. So I really like retro Game Boy stuff. Um, so I am looking forward to testing this out very, very soon. Ooh, nice it looks awesome, too. like ideal. Yeah, yeah. And it's light, but not mm -hmm. too light. You don't want joysticks too light. Um, so very looking forward to that. Thank you, Retro Game Boys, for shipping my uh, my joystick out uh, so quickly and first, so I can show it off. Okay, so on to some news quickly because it was it's a pretty big thing last night. Um, uh, Al from Atari Age uh, posted in the forums. A ton of renders of the box art of all the games that are going to be uh, premiered at PRGE. And then later on, they'll be released in November through the Atari Age store. But let's take a look at those boxes. Um, so they are uh, Blocks, Boulder Dash, Gorf Arcade, Grizzards, Kicks, Raptor, Ruby Q, Slime Boy, Mazeland, Stratovox, Vroom, Atari... Attack the Petsky Robots, Dragon's Havoc, EXO, Galaxian, Keystone Coppers, Uzi the Goose Slime Quest, Pac-Man Collection, 40th Anniversary Edition, Unowars. Is your wallet ready? That should be their new slogan. Atari your Age, wallet. is your wallet ready? <laughs> um, so <laughs> let's take a look at these. Uh, I think I'll go full screen here so we can take a look at them. Boom. Oh, okay. Well, that automatically showed there. That's fine. So here's one for Blocks. Boulder Dash, which is being re-released. Unlimited, so people can... It won't run out this time. A brand new cover. Uh, Gorf Arcade. Beautiful cover by Nathan Strum. That's not playing. <laughs> He's like, what? Grizzards? <laughs> um... And they just announced that there'll be on cartridge saving of games for Grizzards oh. if you don't have Atari Vox or uh, um, the save key. Nope. Uh, Kicks, beautiful box art there. Uh, Raptor. Okay, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so on cartridge saving of games. I've asked yes. about this before, and I got the impression from you that there was no way to output except through the joystick. Uh, it, I don't know the mechanism, but it's like talking to the cartridge and, you know, a certain line on the cartridge is triggered, which sends something on the cartridge. I don't know. It'll probably explain it more in full, but it has been done before on a, on a cartridge. So, because all my ideas cartridge. were like... You know, a cartridge with like a little cable to plug into. <laughs> Onto the, yeah, that, <laughs> like a that would make sense port. too. That was, that, 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 but this apparently is, there's an easier, easier way of doing it. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in on another show, I'm sure, when we talk about Grizzards again and play it. Raptor, beautiful cover. That's really, really nice. Uh, uh, prep packaging by Armscar Coder, Coder. So he did the packaging as well. Very nice. Ruby Q. Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stratavox. Very cartoony front. That's awesome. They've got me. Uh, Thomas Yench's Vroom. Look at that. Look at those graphics. Unfortunately, it, uh, the artist is not uh, mentioned on the back of the box. Hmm. We'll have to find out when we uh, look at them more closely later. Vladimir Zuniga's Uzi the Goose Slime Quest. Dragon's Havoc. Oh, whose is this? Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is Todd's new game that's coming out. We'll talk about this later. Uh, EXO by Muddy Vision. Beautiful. Uh, Galaxian by uh, Pac-Man Plus. Keystone Coppers by Muddy Vision. Oh, I love that cover. So colorful. Yeah, and it, it looks... It's a, very representative. It's, yeah, it represents what's happening in the game. Like, yeah, it's really exactly. Of course, yeah. there's not that many things on any level all at once, but eh, 
<laughs> Why not throw it all on the You're right? It's it's far too unrealistic. <laughs> far too unrealistic oh, for awesome. a video game. Uh, Pac-Man, Pac-Man collection, collection, 40th anniversary edition. Tons of Pac-Man game. Attack of the Petski robots. I have my SNES controller ready for it because <laughs> they've got an adapter, um, and we will be showing that game on the show. Um, uh, Slide Boy Mazeland, VHZC, Uniwars by Pac-Man Plus, uh, the Chaos Engine for the Jaguar, uh, Gods by, for the Jaguar, and Stormbringer, which I didn't know was being released, but uh, uh, Jaguar port by uh, Lawrence Stavely, um, who uh, ported these other two games as well. Um, so looking forward to that too. And that is the end of the list. Uh, not that there's uh, a small amount. That was a lot. Yeah, it was a huge list. <laughs> so, wow, that's that's big. So we're going to be talking with all those developers uh, in the fall when they're released through the Atari Age Store in November. So it's definitely going to be a two-day event. That's nice. way too many people to talk <laughs> in one day. Last time was like nine hours or something. And that's that was less games than this. Normally, I'm like one person per day. I'll talk to one person per day, and then <laughs> but not 27 of them. Yeah, not 27. <laughs> that is a lot. Uh, my catnip not work. Oh, what? Oh, he did redeem the catnip. I didn't. Hear I didn't it hear it. Oh, did anybody hear it? Is it because the normal volume is down I... and the <laughs> and we're on this volume? But they said Thrust said his didn't work. Did not work. Did it didn't noise didn't go off. Am I? Oh, what is happening? That's weird. Okay. Well, uh, we'll uh, give the cat some catnip, and I'll ring a bell. Watch. Well, let's let's switch to the um, okay. cat cam. Okay. So oh, okay. let's see if this works. Ding it. Oh well, yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> <laughs> that worked. It's very effective here. So we'll just do a couple. Oh, it's catnip. It's catnip. Oh, it's catnip. It's okay. So that's fine. So it won't but really still, be they needed to hear a bell for the. Uh, they did. They hear. I don't know how to do this one. Oh, it's just a cats. little bit. Why? Well, what we'll happens? Just... What do you think happens if you give them more? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But this one does, still doesn't like. Uh it. he's getting. He does eat it, but he doesn't go crazy. He's not into drugs. He's he's getting yet. into drugs. He's not he's yet. a teenager he's, now. He's oh, in his rebellious stage. Oh, Makes more of a mess. Love slash murder. Oh yeah, I didn't get into the fifty two hundred forum. I am very. I apologize. Um, let's take a look at that right now. Fifty two hundred oppression continues. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> we'll not talk about fifty two hundred on this show. No. Uh, oh, I bet it's there. Robin Banks release thread. There we go. Oh, 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 there we go. Uh, I think there. One second. One, one thousand. Oh, no. <laughs> Another promise. I know. I Never failed. promise failed. There you go, Robin Banks. Oh, very nice. That's kind of like a, um, I don't know what kind of art style that is. Like pencil. Yeah, I was going to say like pencil. With, like pencil yeah, yeah. crayon or something. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or, or like uh, ink or something like, uh, yeah. like watercolor almost. Very, very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. felt marker. That's what Felt it's like. marker, yep. That, that is a very different looking one. Very nice. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to Robin Banks as well. That yeah. I do love that game. It's it's a twist on Pac-Man. My 5200 still isn't upgraded, but I found <laughs> somebody to upgrade it. So hopefully that is coming soon. And that's why there's been a little bit of 5200 um, oppression <laughs> at the moment. So we have delayed long enough and let Todd languish. So. Uh, I have to wait for Darcy to come back because my earpiece is cut out. There we go. Oh, it's back. I'm back. So, today we are <clears throat> very happy to have the developer of Dragon Racer Trials of the Worm, Dragon's Descent, Dragon's Descent for the 2600, 7800, Dragon's Cache, Dragon's Havoc, a lot of dragons, and the upcoming Harpy's Curse. He has been nominated 
for six Atari Homebrew Awards. And tonight we have the exclusive world premiere of his Atari 7800 game, Harpy's Curse for the 7800. So please welcome to Zero Page Homebrew, Todd Fermansky, AKA Revan Tooley. Now let me just unmute you there and switch over <coughs> and hopefully it works. There we are. Hey, Todd. Yay, it works. Yes. That is excellent. So everything went smoothly this time because I was reviewing the last time we were we did Atari Age Day and there was a bit of a uh, problem hearing you. And so today we sorted it all out. We got him on the stream five minutes before the show and we, we got sorted it, going. it out or we lucked out. We lucked out. Really. <laughs> it's, it's a crapshoot every time. <laughs> so welcome to the show. Uh, so we're really excited to uh, talk to you today about all of your games and that's what the developer spotlight is about is running through the full um full gamut of all your games or all the games that you wish to release anyway <laughs> so uh oh well thank you for coming on and agreeing to come on um so let's um start at the beginning yes uh yes are you sure the audio is good they're quite low they want uh, they want more. An adjustment. Okay. Give us more. More Todd. More Todd. More Todd. Todd. More Todd. Okay. Louder Todd. So, so that should be good, hopefully. Testing. Testing. Uh, is that good for everyone? It's going into the red, which is we're also in the red, so hopefully that's good enough. Once he talks with sustain. So the first question is... <laughs> what is the first question, Darcy? The first question is... Um, are you, in fact, a dragon? <laughs> in a human body. I'm seeing body. a lot of representation here, and Darcy's stealing my I think questions. people want to know, like, are you a dragon in disguise? <laughs> I mean, hedgehogs and bandicoots were taken, August so I just are... figured, you know, pick something obscure that nobody knows about. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dragons are pretty obscure. I don't know. So let's... I don't like there's any big TV series that has come out. <laughs> No. No, nobody picks dragons to be the the big enemy in any you know movies or TV shows or books or anything. Yeah, but the, the, the dragon is not the enemy in these games. The dragon is the hero. That's why I'm wondering. <laughs> That's there's true. A, there's a, a clear bi pro bias towards dragons, and uh, I'm just wondering where that comes from. I mean, well, yeah, to make the dragon the hero. If you don't want to admit it, I get it. <laughs> you know, you've been hiding for centuries, and there's no reason to reveal it now. Everybody, subscribing. One second. <laughs> Thank you, Muddy Funster and Kabuto JRM, because they kind of talk over you the subscription. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, no. Um, well, I mean, I think part of it actually, they, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I might have tried doing something ridiculous like making a carpenter or plumber the hero, but I don't know. That, that doesn't <laughs> <out>. um, <laughs> No, that's a weird choice, really. A plumber and know, a carpenter? You could be anything in a game and you, you choose to be a plumber. I, I, I don't think that would catch up. <laughs> <laughs> but no, exactly. You know, um, for me, it's. I mean, everybody knows what dragons are, yet you can still in, just invent qualities about them and people roll with it. You know, you can say a dragon has feathers or likes garlic, and people are like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Even though you generally kind of think of them as big lizards with, you know, wings, breathe fire. I think there's yeah. also, I mean, you know, I, I kind of like playing with the. They're, the the power fantasy in games, you know, where you want to, you know, you want to be something else. And I think dragons have, the dragons I make usually have this element of greed to them along with everything else, which I think is, it's something I like to explore a little bit. And it, I guess if we get to Havoc, you know, trying to balance this idea of, you know, of anger and power with, with control. Um, so that that's just something I've been exploring a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's, it's... It's been a fun thing that, again, you, everybody knows what a dragon is, but I can kind of invent qualities about them, you know, um, that, that, you know, people will generally accept. It's an, it's this paradoxically a very iconic, but also very abstract, abstract, you know, concept and creature. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, it... it... And not at all that you're a dragon. <laughs> um, it, it makes sense to, to pick something that's that's um, more flexible, like like a, a fictional character rather than say a plumber, because a plumber would well, even though they extended him to have superpowers. But um, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of qualities already imbued in a dragon, 
but uh, you can extend it to do anything really, and they mm -hmm. can fly. Which uh, they do in in your games, so that uh, makes a yeah, lot of I sense. I can see that he They're told flexible. you earlier not to reveal his true <laughs> dragon nature. It's fine. We can move on. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't have to. I can say not a dragon, but I do live with two. I mean, yeah, I think it's fine. You, I mean, we call them cats, but they have a lot of qualities. They sleep a lot. They tend to have very active, very like vicious, you know, moments before going back to sleep. They, you know, have very sensitive, yeah. bit sensitive stomachs that they don't like being touched generally. <laughs> is that true oh, he jumps when I reach for him <laughs> that is pretty funny oh, the um, timing was perfect so uh, Thrust is saying that your volume goes down when we talk um, I'm not sh I did remove that so it shouldn't happen but I'm just going to check to make sure right now so just one second Make sure there's no filters, no. Um, but I'm gonna remove something. One second. Things are happening. Yep. Important things. It's boring, but there. They have that, to happen. That may fix it. Okay. Um, okay, so let's load up Dragon Racer Trials of the Worm. Uh, this is from 2019. It's your first game, your 2600 game. Um, so, uh, also, besides dragons, where does the name Revan Tuli come from? That's a, a, it's not a word, it's not an English word, it's... It's, um, it's kind of a bad weird free association trying to find a handle of that best limit that stuck but um todd means fox in old english or, or, or scottish but then um Reventuli is finnish for aurora the aurora borealis but it literally means fox fire so, oh so that's the you know and with the anonymity of the net that's just that, something i kind of picked and um picked and decided to go with wait i think i won <laughs> <laughs> I was upset for a second, and then it turns out that I won. There we go. Okay. I didn't have it on the screen. Um, what? But I won! So, uh, let's let's go... Well, well, Darcy plays this game. Uh, let's go into the history of, of your association with programming and um, in terms of machines and consoles and different languages is... The Atari 2600, your first foray into programming. No, it's it's, it's funny. It's it's actually one of my later <laughs> later ones. Um, I mean, I grew up actually generationally. I kind of my the first times I really played was like the NES and Sega Master System. Um, got into like programming programming um, on the Macintosh with HyperCard. You know, learned to see a, my day job. I do. Um, Research and teach. Uh, do a lot of uh, like um, high-end three, like three D programming, virtual reality, things like that. Um, it's a lot of okay. fun. I, I, I love the I love the work. But um, again, the, the scope is gigantic. You know, I'm working with teams, and this is kind of a, the the homebrew stuff. Is I wanted to go down and make you know make a complete game from start to finish. Try to get it as polished as I can, and also learn you know. Um, Learn a lot of these old platforms and, you know, see if I can get a fun experience in, you know, something that's measured in kilobytes instead of gigabytes. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed a lot of uh, the developers that uh, are making games for the 2600 and 7800 have an extensive background in, in development, uh, in, in programming and languages. And uh, it's almost like a break. It's, it's from, or a challenge, a break and a challenge. <laughs> Uh, from their day job or what they've done in the past. I, um, hopefully the sound is a little bit better. I've turned down the game sound now, so just keep me updated. It's, people are saying Darcy's joystick is making, uh, cutting it out, cutting you out, but... Uh, Finally, I'm winning a game and you want me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn... Oh, our mic is way loud. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Check, 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 check. Okay. So, um, 
now on to what your history with the Atari 2600 is and why you chose the 2600 to uh, release games on and make games on. And was it your first platform, retro console platform, to make games on? Um, <laughs> but I've been programming long enough that a lot of the stuff I started with or is now, I guess, considered retro. But no, the, the, the homebrew, the 2600, I think I started with... I mean, it's not the first console, but it, it was the first real mainstream console. The fact that it was a console generation before kind of I got into uh, into video games gave it a bit of an allure. Um, it's one that my like my older brothers grew up playing. And, you know, I certainly knew about it and stuff. But you know, when I was younger, I'm like, no, that's the old obsolete. You know, you know, it, it's old news. <laughs> and now, you know. Um, but going back and looking through, I also love, you know, digital history, the games in particular. And so just kind of, this has been an excuse for me to not only learn the platform, but kind of learn the history, not only of the technology, but just the design of how you started with, you know, you started with Pong um, and you got into, yeah. you know, and, and, and role playing games and Star Trek on, on university mainframe machines, you know, and how those weird right. threads came together and, you know, and now we're in, you know, this, again, very, very interesting landscape of, of games and interactivity and, and digital spaces. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating, too, the, the the threads that connect from one game to another and the advancement. It's like, oh, we have blocks on the screen now. Well, let's make those blocks higher resolution. Or we can, you know, do this with the blocks and, and put fake gravity on the blocks. And, and it... And it just evolves from, you know, step by step by step. And so I love watching historical documentaries on video gaming and the progression of it, because it also, it, it affects more than video games. It affects uh, all of our entertainment and, and media and just everything around us more than just video games. So <laughs> video games are kind of a catalyst for a lot of things as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so why the twenty six hundred? Why why choose this one? I think. I mean, part of it, it, it is iconic. You know, again, uh, and and it was it was. Um, I, there's a lot of documentation. I kind of got into actually the community. You know, the Atari age. There's you know, a lot of great people there. A lot of helpful people. You know, so when I went through, yeah. I have found a lot of. You know, and I said like I want. You know, I should make an. I should try making a game for the Atari. Um, I went and saw there. Okay, there's a tutorial. We already have. You know, here's the source code, and people are like, "Yo, go nuts!" You know, go for it. And uh, yeah, um, you know, I started playing, and, and again, kind of the hardware. Um, you know, I managed to find like a uh, you know um, an SD card, uh, can, think, yeah, Harmony card that I you know was able to test and picked up an old 2600. Yeah. And again, just kind of. And again, there, there's a lot. The, the challenge was there. It was, yeah, this, like you said, it was kind of a break, but also a challenge. Um, yeah. For my day job, I almost likened it, or like, kind of like martial arts training wearing weights. Um, if you can make a fun game yeah, in, yeah. in four to sixteen kilobytes, then when you go back and have <laughs> gigabytes to work with, you're like, okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's do this. <laughs> you can stretch out too much, maybe. Yeah, and, and with with the twenty six hundred, there are confines, and you can. Especially if you limit yourself to like 4K or, or you know even 8K, yeah, yeah. like you can only do so much. So you can't just there. There isn't a lot of feature creep that it comes in. If if anything, you're like trying to get more room. You're like, oh, I need four more bytes <laughs> to store this variable that I've added in, and I've got to uh, consolidate, you know, two two variables into one and split it up and into one byte. And yeah, I think. You know, all the things you said, like the community is there, the availability of the hardware, there's just millions of 2600s out there. Um, the sharing aspect of the community in terms of source code, the, um, the investment that people have in the success of other people's games. Like, if they see a game, they're like, oh my god, this is a great idea. They they go all in. They want to beta test it. They want, they offer graphics. They offer suggestions. They they say, how about this? How about this? How about this? And and I just... I, I don't... I can't compare many of the other communities, because I concentrate on the Atari community, 
but I, I think 2600 especially is one of the most prolific um, programming communities in terms of retro gaming out there. Uh, I, I mean, I, I maintain the list and do the awards, so I know how many <laughs> games are made each year. And it's it's baffling how many games are made each year. Just astronomical in numbers, like hundreds. I think the other aspect is there's, there's good tools. I mean, I, pretty much all these games I wrote using um, the variant of basic, either Atari basic or 7800 basic. Um, with yeah. a like, couple little spots of assembly, but again, that's the... Um, I think there's a, there's kind of a challenge there too because you know it's but I also like to focus on on the design and you know assembly. Right. I'm I'm honestly just don't have the patience for for pure assembly. I incredible respect for everybody <laughs> who does. Um, yeah. But that's the um, but also I think I mean and, and you know more tech is is awesome. But I also think there you know you can make. You know, you can make an awesome game with 52 pieces of paper, a deck of cards, you know, it can be very engaging. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. while I love, you know, modern games, you know, Elden Ring or, you know, virtual reality like Half-Life Alex, um, yeah. you can still have a really fun, engaging game, uh, you know, it just, that doesn't need to pull, you know, be going and pull out every single tech stop possible. Uh, in fact, I like looking at paths yeah. not traveled uh, and seeing, like, yeah, if the Atari, you know, if the 7800 or 2600 stuck around a little longer, or if I was thrown back into, if my time machine crashed in 1983, <laughs> what would I be doing? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you'd be programming and assembly. <laughs> I, I'd that's probably, true. I'd probably pick up more of it then, if, if, that, if it came to that. <laughs> that's probably why the time machine yeah. crashed in the first place, was I, I made a, I, I called the wrong register. I, I think if I had to crash a time machine, I'd probably go back to that era as well with, with the explosion of home computing and, and home consoles. It's just a really exciting time for people like us who are really into this, this kind of thing. And I, I mean, we, we lived through it, so it's like, let's, let's visit it again. And the music's not bad, too. So uh, let's, let's briefly touch on where you got the idea for essentially a racing game. Let's actually uh, change this up so Darcy isn't like completely bored. Yeah, uh, yeah, if you hit select, you can switch the board. Um, yeah. Let's give him that one. Go for it. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> to learn how to do a new map. So it's, it's racing with dragons with um, essentially a path you have to follow that's that's laid out with the, the things you have to collect on the screen. So where did you get an idea of dragons racing? Really silly. You know those memes that are like, you know, the first letter of your first name and the last letter of your last name kind of things? There was one that's the, yes. what Atari game are you? And mine turned oh. out to be Dragon Racer. Um, it, wow. And so I was like, okay, I have never made a racing game before. I'm not really, you know, Mario Kart notwithstanding, we're not really into racing games. I mean, I don't, I don't dislike them, but it was... Yeah. Um, but I was like, okay, if I'm gonna make one for the like that actually sounds like a, a fun game. It does sound like something you'd see on the on the store shelves. So like, what would that yep. end up being like? And so that was kind of went in, and that was the little catalyst. And I was already kind of wanted to learn the Atari 2600. So this, you know, I had a, I had a prompt, I had a goal, and yep. I had the challenge. Okay, we have two sprites. Okay, so you have two dragons racing each other. I use the the ball or uh, missile graphics for uh, for the gemstone and the fire breath. Yep. Pink and pink. Yep. You know and <laughs> oh and blue and blue. Yeah. You know, and then I think that it's either the ball or the missile that, that I alternate between the two. So every other frame it's drawing. Okay. That's how both can breathe fire. Um, uh, okay. Okay. But yeah, that's um, the uh, that that's what started it. Just random chance dictated your first 2600 game that's that's really cool um and and the physics from this game actually carries over to your next game dragon's descent mm -hmm. which we're going to take a look at right now <laughs> um so uh, what why did you incorporate the uh the momentum into you know the, the racing game and then carry it over to Dragon's Descent rather than a straightforward movement. I think movement again if for a racing game for a racing game you, you need you want physics. I mean that's that's what racing is. Yeah. If you know you move yeah. your the, the thing you're racing around like a mouse or you know like a cursor that does 
you know, it might be easier, that might, you know, be more intuitive, but you're basically just moving a mouse around uh, or a cursor around. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. so much of racing is trying to, you know, deal with momentum, deal with, you know. Uh, and I think keeping with that, again, I wanted to have, I've been thinking about doing kind of a roguelike for the 2600 and what that would end up looking like um, even before this. And this is kind of where a lot of stuff came together. And uh, and making the walls lethal, that's what happened to me of in, in built in a hardware collision um, and don't have enough space to do proper collision response. <laughs> you just you just make the walls deadly. It worked Which, for Berserk. You know, the mo yeah, exactly. And people love Berserk. And it the deadly walls and the momentum, the combination of those two things make this game very challenging and very unique and uh which which it needs it you need challenge you need the risk reward mm -hmm. it's like oh i can zoom through these mazes but not too fast i need to slow down and things randomly appear here and there the enemies you don't know where they're gonna appear mm -hmm. especially the later ones where they yeah they try and ze they appear over top of you where it forces you to keep moving as well so a lot of unique enemies too, a lot of variety. Now that was, yeah. I think, I, mean, I had a lot of fun with this, and you know, especially due to the limitations. Again, we, there's two sprites. I generally don't like to flicker to do more, so I was like, okay, we have the player and something else, like be it a monster, be it a treasure, you know, and yeah. make it make sure the monster is sophisticated enough that if, even if there's only one in the room, you still need to worry about it. Um, Yes. And, and they have really good random movements, too. Like, the ones that don't directly chase after you or appear on top of you. They Their movements are erratic enough that you don't want to be near them. I end up hating the jellyfish more than even the ones that, like, actively chase you. The ones that they chase you can manipulate. <laughs> yes, yes. But if they're blocking the doorway, the jellyfish is like, come on, get get out of the way. But you can, you can go to the other room and then come back and kind of... Mm -hmm kind of uh, cheese it that way um, but yeah I, I really really enjoyed the the variety of enemies in this game and it keeps it very fresh Do you get from bonus room points for only having six points when you finish the map <laughs> <laughs> that's right you get a bonus of zero um, ivory tower collection says i like the fade in out effect between the rooms in this game so yeah, it's, it's subtle. It's super subtle, but those kind of things really add to a game. Mm -hmm. And you may not even notice them, because I didn't really notice them until he just said that, because it's very fast, but it just adds that slickness onto it, right? It was it was something like what I, you know, it was pretty before, it what, it did feel too sudden, and because it's all, all the, the each level is the same color, it becomes disorienting without uh... some kind of transition. It feels like a jump cut. And so, yeah, the, thankfully, like, the, I actually really like the way the Atari color palette is laid out because it's all just one yes. number, and you just have each hue is is in sections of sixteen, and each, and the value. If you just you can count it up and get a nice rainbow effect, or you can lock it in sixteen yeah. values and fade within that color. So it's actually really straightforward to do, and I, I have a lot of fun with that. Really, really smart. Yeah, uh, like we Darcy and I were wondering about the C sixty four palette one time and we and we looked it up i was like why do they why do they pick these weird colors and and the story is i don't know if it's true or not they picked eight colors some generic you know I decent think... colors that they're, they're okay they're a little bit you know pastel -y. um but then they literally just went opposite on the color wheel and came up with terrible garish colors yeah i think it um, was it was arbitrary like they basically said like oh yeah pick pick the eight Colors, just because the way the hardware works out, you're also going to get, yeah, the, the inverse of those colors. So yeah, it has a very... <laughs> that's one of those, I mean, kind of like the Spectrum Color Clash. Like, it, yeah, you, you could say it's not the best palette, but again, it, is it a Commodore 64 without, you know, without those browns, <laughs> that weird brown and, and pastel? Ugh. Oh, know. yeah. It, 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 it definitely stands out, the, the colors on the C64, and people have used them. But going yeah. back to the colors on the uh, uh Atari. Atari 2600 wow was it ahead of its time the the um, the 128 colors is it 128 right 128. that it has is is astounding it's it's amazing and so versatile and really it took a while to catch up from other systems to catch up to that many colors 
Well, and it feels like the, the issue is you usually can only use about two at a time unless you get tricky with it. Uh, but yeah, when I was yeah. getting the, the backgrounds in Havoc, um, I was realizing these look amazing. Like, because I was I was doing some tricks to get more and more colors on the screen, and I did one that was just a, a more or less full gradient, and like. This this is almost looks like not quite 16 bit, but like yeah, I, I've seen some budget Genesis titles that don't you know <laughs> that you know that look worse than this. So yeah, it, it was yeah you know if you can leverage it, it's, and, it's how you use them. That's that's the thing, and 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 even if you can put only ah. two colors on the screen at a time or or three, you know, you yeah. have the the playfield ball, but you have a different color each line that you can use which is like wow the the colors that people can get out of the uh 2600 is is just it's astounding Definitely. um luckily you know people are uh, vertical darcy's hat you could make that the orange and, ah! you know a pink and then a gray and then a brown pants and and all of a sudden you look like you have a, a system that's way more advanced than the 2600 and the math's easy because yeah, you just you just increment it by one or two and then you get a, a nice easy gradient um instead of having to do like that a, a table and a whole mess like that. Yeah, a very nice rainbow effect, very, very simple, or, you know, the fade in, fade out. Um, so tell us about the um, the mazes and the randomized levels and the layout and how you make sure that it all works together and the key is over here and the exit's over here. That's the... Uh, I'll have to post... I posted a... Darcy's having fun. Sorry, I, uh, I got a heart. And I was like, yay! And then I, I ran into the wall behind the heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Um, I'll have to post uh, on the... Um, I post on the blog, and I think I, I've talked about it a little bit online, but yeah, at the the shorter answer is, I, I mean, I kind of wanted a Desert Island game, so I didn't want just a maze that was always static for this game that you could kind of... People could play blindfolded once they get good enough at it. I wanted, you know, I wanted to expand. Right. I A lot of my research has been in procedural content generation, and so, but instead nice. of doing, like, Making you know a, a, a you know generating a world or a continent or a city with this I'm like okay I I want a maze that's big enough that you can kind of get lost in but small enough you can do it in under a minute and you can't get that lost I wanted loops and stuff so I just made it's an eight by eight potential square and then I just put all the uh, points of interest like the treasure room the exit yeah. the key and I put a dummy room which helps make loops and then I just connect them all. Okay. And um, and because they're they're randomly seated, if you start with the same number, you'll get the same maze. But since I can have, you know, right. 255 squared, yeah, I can you know, I can have thousands of possible mazes. So you can play through like you got. I, I've gotten to the point where I can almost play through the the stock first eight levels blindfolded. But <laughs> if I hit the random number, yeah, I've no you've idea. played them so much. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and how many? You said there's two fifty five mazes or uh, potential mazes well, there's or more. Okay, if you there are there's two hundred fifty five squared number of seeds. So let me just yeah, it's two fifty five squared. Oh, yeah, okay. there, there, it's a two wow. it's a two byte seed. Um, and yeah, so what yeah. I do is if you pick one byte, it ends up being kind of like the game's level, and then the other two the other second byte are the levels. So. Uh -oh. It'll start repeating after about 255 levels. Although I also made it make it so the first eight get harder, so it's more like um, right. you know, about 260 and change before it repeats. I don't think anybody's ever gotten that far, but <laughs> that's that's enough to play. There's a good variety there, that's for sure. I mean, it took a while for people to find the uh, Pac-Man kill screen. So, <laughs> oh, is there one? There is not a kill screen, as oh. far as I know. Um, Oh, okay. But you're just talking about the Pac-Man's kill screen. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of levels to go through, and you have to have a very high skill to, to make it through to the, to the end kill screen on Pac-Man, that's for sure. Um, so wh where did the idea from for this game come from, for the, for the mazes and the, you know, the power-ups? I think you're talking a little yeah. bit about RPG. I was kind of. I mean, it's I, a light RPG. I was. I was kind of working on like some roguelike ideas, and I was. But you know, again, one of these things where on a modern machine, it just you never stop. You're like, okay, now I need to. Now I'm simulating shoelaces. I need. To, I need to stop and take a deep <laughs> breath. So like, okay, if, if on the 2600, you'll have limits. Yeah, once you once you run out of ROM space, you kind of have to stop adding stuff. Um, but then, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they already had kind of some of the code like the the. The momentum code from from Dragon Racer, um, 
Right. And and decided, okay, yeah, like I, you know, you always have enough of knights going through and and looting dungeons. Um, and so, but yeah, like <laughs> yeah. If, you know, yeah, dragons go, they fly, they breathe fire. Um, they have kind of a vicious streak to them, so which can be fun to to embody in a game. And so, you know, having again, that was kind of just the idea, and then that gave me the scope of okay, I have. I decided to do, uh, uh, this is a 16k cartridge, because I, I needed the extra RAM, honestly, um, for starters, but the, uh, but yeah, wanted, again, wanted a Desert Island game, I mean, Adventure is a classic, but again, once you know the, the layout of Adventure, you, you can basically play it blindfolded, um, yeah, but, and, and the, the, li the limitations of a 2600 as well, um, having a procedurally generated world opens up a lot. It feels bigger than it actually is. Do I need a Definitely. Controller? Yeah, yeah. So we're going to move on to your 7800 version mm -hmm. of Dragon's Descent, which is right here. Here's the box for it. Um, so. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I have the Atari box plugged in. Sand stuff. Um, so what was the motivation behind bringing the 2600 game over to the 7800? Was it because you wanted a project you were familiar with and had the code for, and it, because it was your first 7800 game? Yeah, I, that was definitely a lot of it was, you know, when I saw that there was, a, a, you know, a well-developed version of BASIC for the 7800 and Dragon's Ascent was made in basic, so I'm like, okay, yeah, this should be pretty straightforward, and it largely was. Um, I also kind of designed, I mean, I kind of wanted Dragon's Ascent to be a Desert Island game that, you know, if you only had one game, you could play it, you know, you wouldn't run out of mazes very quickly, and it would always kind of be right. engaging. Um, but I also meant it to be, since it can fit on the 2600, this one, right? I'm, I've been have tended to plans to kind of port it to just about anything. Is anything that can support two sprites, <laughs> You know, yeah, um, and a play field, yeah. You know, and so like seventy hundred week was the logical next step. But I've been looking. I have been. I have a prototype that's about halfway done on the Game Boy. Um, I'm, oh, I'm porting it to C, nice. and see, with that, I'm also looking at like the NES, the Genesis. Um, right. Crazy part of me was learning like how would it work on a ZX Spectrum um, or ZX Spectrum. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, just it, you know, and again, it's it's they always take longer, and I. I've got you know uh, obviously distracted, but that's this is kind of the, if I want to learn a uh, new platform, this is the game I want to try implementing on that platform. That makes a lot of sense, and it's and it's a game that people can really easily pick up and play. There's only a couple elements mm -hmm. to it um, as as the levels progress. There's bosses and a dragon that chases you and things like that, <laughs> but the basics are all there, and, and I think it's a very approachable game. So that makes a lot of sense to pick this one to, to be able to port to different um, different systems like you said two sprites on the screen at, at one at any one time and uh, you're dying <laughs> taking too long in the mazes it's going all dark <laughs> yeah it's yeah it makes a lot of sense um, so now in your games I I only have the credits for you down as graphics, coding, music, sounds. Um, is is this a conscious effort that you do? Uh, a conscious choice that you do everything yourself, or is it just? It's like ah, I might as well do it. I'm the one doing it. Um, I think a lot of it is. I I, I did definitely want to have the, the homebrew projects at least initially be solo. Um, you know. Um, I think uh, Benedict Sheffer does the artwork for the 7800 games. We, I finally had, uh, you know, finally got an artist come in because I'm, I'm not the, you know, there are better illustrators than me out there when it comes to, to box and manual art layout. I can do it, but right. Um, it's also on top of uh, programming the game. It's just, it's that, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Even, even, I mean, not even so much the work, although it's certainly a lot of like time, but just shifting that design brain, programmer brain, and and yeah, I got online. There's, right. there's so many great artists that. Um, you know, and especially when you have folks like volunteer, like Ben just said, you know, hey, would you, you know, I did kind of, yeah. I did kind of a, a, you know, a sketch of this. Would you, would you like to? And I would, sure, this is, this looks awesome. Thank you. Um, again, like the community. Yeah, yeah. and that's that's what that's the great thing about the community. If somebody's like, it strikes a chord in somebody, especially hey. artists, they're like, oh, I have something in my head that 
that would work really well for this game. Mm -hmm. Run away, run away, Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jolt uh, Bolt says, I have Dragon's Descent for the 7800 and love it. I just got the 7800, so it was amongst... It's not really biting it. So it was amongst the first homebrews that I definitely recommend. So there you go. Somebody got a 7800 and it was the first game they bought. Um, so that, that speaks a lot to its approachability and, you know, familiar... You gotta move! You gotta move! I know! <laughs> approachability uh, for people to look at the game and go, oh, that looks like fun, and it's understandable just at a glance. It's also, the Descent also, in particular, was kind of my homage to, I wanted to make it something that would fit in, in the arcades. The cable. In the, you know, in the early 80s, you know, next to like Dig Dug or right. something, you know. Yeah, it, I could see it, um, it as an arcade style game. It has the difficulty enough especially with kind of the timeout where the screen goes black it's like you've been taking too long i want another quarter exactly no like well it's, the key part of arcade design is i mean yeah you don't want to have a static area where you can just like park yourself in the corner and leave like that's you know that's right that's honestly just not good business as crass as that might sound um yeah so like right. at, pretty, virtually every arcade game has a you know not a screensaver, more of a de you know, like the screensaver means like no, you you're you're gonna get a game <laughs> over one way or another. Yeah, either a countdown timer or the boss, the big boss that comes after you, um, that bounces on the screen and 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 uh, chases you down is almost invincible, and you have to be like near the edge of the screen. Mm -hmm. So this has the the evil dragon uh, that comes, and and the warning is oh the screen gets dark and all that, and and it. Even if, because it's, even if though it's not an arcade machine, that adds to the danger. Do you, you get caught on the walls or something? Uh, you can't, you maybe. can't slide, there's sometimes you'll get stuck and need to move out. You shouldn't be able to get it, um, like, mired, mired. Stuff. You should be able to back out, but yeah. That's... Uh, so, sticky walls. Yeah. That's... <laughs> it's part of the game, Darcy. There's some sticky walls hey, in the game. I, uh, <laughs> proof, I proof of the game having things that happen in it. <laughs> People who complain yeah, about the, the sticky walls fine. should just play on hard mode, um, where the walls are lethal, <laughs> so... Oh, there you go. Then oh, you they are touch. lethal in, uh... uh so yeah. Hard mode is... Oh, I think it was going to call it classic mode, because that's the... Yeah, if you want to play the 2600 rule. And arguably, I think right. the balance is... If you're especially the arcade, like... I, where I was playing, we were playing, a, uh, I was looking at the high score, they did a high score competition on the, in the forums, and somebody said, well, I'll just, I just collect the gems because I don't need to be feel more powerful on, on the base, on the standard mode, and I'm like, wow, really? Okay, I, um, <laughs> like, in, in hard mode, you, challenging. you do want, you do, you, it, it is a, it's a decision whether I want to be more powerful, <laughs> I want to have more health, or I want more points. Yeah, when I played, I find going for a balance is good. Maybe a little bit more power than health, because when you get to the boss, you want to get it done pretty quick. But, you know, 50-50 with just maybe one or two more power on it. You know? Yeah. And it depends how, how you play it and how good you are at the game, too, if you're an offensive player or a defensive player. But that's the flexibility of this game, too. You can play it multiple different ways. That was that was my goal, yeah. And I, I, you know, that that was the hope, and I'm, I'm glad to see people like bring in different strategies. You know, I can kind of see like mm -hmm. people who do get to kill screen Pac-Man, like, dude would would probably <laughs> play, do nothing but play, you know, collect gems and you know. Yeah, yeah. If you're going for a high score, and some people do, and if you get that good and you want to, you know, finish the game. You would just collect gems. You wouldn't bother powering yourself up if you're that good. If you make it to the end, you just go score only run. But if you get if you're late in the game, you're like, oh crap, I've never gotten this far on the level before. Like, do I need another 500 points or do I want a heart just to pass? You know, if it gets if it buys you another level, then it's worth the trade off. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So let's go into the next game, Dragon's Cash. <laughs> I didn't get to put my name in. No, sorry. Next time. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> So here's the box for Dragon's Cash. Let me change out the cartridge as well. Thomas Yench is on me for that. There we go. <laughs> He's pretty good at reminding me of things I'm not doing. 
Well, that's the, uh-huh. uh, the yeah, the Dragon's Descent. I don't know if you have the, the 7800 has a different box. The black box for Descent is the 2600. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm showing the 2600. Here is the, sorry, I missed the 7800 um, yeah. Dragon's Descent box. No, ben, ben, did that, silver. That co- ben, ben did the cover work for the 7800 boxes. Yeah, really, really nice. Yeah, very, like, reminiscent of, like, D&D type covers. Mm-hmm. Very, very nice. So, an- another very different game here. We've got a, a <laughs> puzzle game. Um, so tell us about the uh, development history behind this. Uh, oh, no. Do you, do you like puzzle games? Is it something that you've wanted to make? Was it a challenge uh, pss, 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 that you wanted to have? One second, the cat's eating cables. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> Sorry. I've got, I've got two cats myself. I very, very <laughs> you, you understand. Yeah, they're, they're trouble. Yeah, no. They like attention. Um, yeah, again, I hadn't... It's kind of like the racing. I, I, I love puzzle games, but yeah, hadn't really made one. Um, I'm one of those weirdos that likes columns more than Tetris. I, I like the building of cascades and stuff. Right. And, uh. um, you know, and it was... It, and it, it, it felt like it would be a pretty straightforward thing to program. And it was, Again, when I wanted to do, kind of wanted to do an informal like Dragon Trilogy, um, I wanted to do different genres, and I'm like, okay, I haven't done a puzzle game. I also, I like making yeah. new games for homebrew, but it was like, okay, what is what would making it just a straight port feel like? You know, I, I don't have to worry about design because I have the design. The 7800 yeah. needed, like, it really needed a, a head-to-head puzzle drop game. You know, it didn't have mm. it had clacks, um, but like, yeah. it didn't have a Tetris, it didn't have a Puyo Puyo. And you got, you know, yeah. and it feels like it really, you know, you got two controllers, it's, a, it's powerful and upstream. Um, yeah, and that, that makes sense, like, filling in gaps where games are needed, mm-hmm. and, and there's going to be a certain number of people that are wanting a puzzle game, so it's, it's smart, especially if you are inclined to like puzzle games and want to make it, or have the, want to have the challenge of making it, too. Yeah, and technically, I was like, okay, the 7800 has this, you know, higher, you know, this this higher um, color palette that you can use with certain limitations. So that's how I made the gems right. uh, with it, with the glittering effect and things like that. And and some other techniques like the double buffer is what I ended up using to do, especially the head-to-head where you're doing two full games at once. Um, mm. Folks were asking about adding an AI opponent. I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, I'm actually, in my perspective, <laughs> like, um, I could... Just the way I was programming, I could barely get think like two full games running at once without getting some slowdown. Having <laughs> so, like having a, a, an AI basically has to see the future. But like you know, it, it's it's difference between building a chess set yeah. and building a robot that plays chess. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's quite a challenge. Yeah, um, I think it would be possible. Um, you'd have to like stream it out over several frames. You'd have to do like a weird streaming kind of thing. I think, but. Um, also, like, right. very, yeah, yeah. very few 8-bit puzzle games had have have an AI opponent. And the ones that are, are like are like in the 90s, they're like really late. Um, even columns, the yeah, initial yeah. columns didn't have opponents um, at first. Uh, on the yeah, it's 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 a bit different from Dragon's Descent, where you have like very simple rules, just go straight after a person, as opposed to like, oh, I have to flip things and there's multiple combinations which is the best combination especially if like it's the advanced ai that you're playing or a simple and there's different oh yeah it's it's a lot yeah it's a lot you know and i mean it's a good challenge <laughs> good challenge but it, it was it was kind of challenging enough again i was still fairly new to this you know getting you know getting the cascades getting the color depth and getting you know two players simultaneous working which is if you're going to do that you know start out from the get-go get- get- you don't want to add multiplayer late in the development cycle. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you want to you want to think about the things beforehand that you want to put in, especially things b- big things like AI and two players so that you can design around it and leave enough room for yourself mm-hmm. in the code to to put that in. We have a question from Vitoko. Are you reusing the sprites on the uh, still gem. gems? Those turn into um those actually end up being a uh, part of the the the, the 7800 basic kind of has a play field or tile space. It's it, it, the way it uses the, the graphics. Again, 7800 sprites are are strange. They're display lists. But yeah, what happens is I actually yeah. have the, the ones that are falling down slowly are sprites. But then I I turn them into a block map once they once they uh, hit the ground or you know 
hit the other gems and at the bottom of the right. Oh. Right, right, right. That makes sense. It's it's like what you would do on the 2600 as well. If if you wanted to drop, you know, solid blocks down, right. you would turn them into, you know, play field after they hit the bottom or hit where they're they're supposed to be. Making it smooth was the decision again. Would have been a lot easier to go have them move down section by section, by, by block by block. Yeah. The um I mean the 16-bit Genesis version of columns, the original one does that, but this way also, you know, again, adding the speed up and such, um, it was more challenging, but I think it, it, it looks better, and it was, you know, it, it was a, it was a fun. Thing to do. Yeah, I, I like the smooth smoothness as well. I mean, there's there's lots of uh, block dropping games that are t -t 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 one at a time block dropping, but um, yeah, the smoothness really works for this one, um, and and it it looks better that way. I think it it feels more polished like uh you put more effort into it it's like okay you can you know put put them in right. exact slots quite easily and be able to track them more easily if they're in those slots but something falling down and knowing exactly when they hit at the bottom and also you have a bit more i don't know flexibility when moving the blocks around it's like oh i'm not quite to the bottom yet right and and if you're doing tile based movement you don't know when it's exactly connected um, you're like, okay, it's at the bottom, but can I still move it? It's, it's like a rhythm oh, game no, at that point. Oh, no, it's too late. Yes, yeah, it turns some. It turns into a different feel for the game, so it's a definitely a choice that you have to make uh, when designing a block-dropping game. Um, so, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I just also say, like, and while, the, while this is basically a straight port of columns, I did want to at least add a little bit of design eventually. Um, so, I, like, in the battle mode or the... In the single player, it's called training mode. I do it. I kind of made a system, kind of like Puzzle Fighter, but different. Where you, when you match gems, they don't go away, but you kind of store them, and then you can release them all at once, uh -huh. and use that to, right. to attack nice. the other, uh, to attack your opponents. Um, yeah, Puzzle Fighter is a really fun game. Yeah. So that was kind of a nod, uh, you know, a nod to that. Um, you know, it wasn't exactly Puzzle Fighter, but you know, similar enough that that was kind of the, <laughs> the hybrid. Again, I think it. it I, Playthrough, I've had some fun, you know, playing with friends. You had, had also I, again, I made a two-player yeah. game right before the pandemic hit, so that was I didn't get as much Perfect. testing as well, I wanted to. Good and bad. People are locked in their house and have time to play games, but the testing, yeah. And I, I, I found that when people make strictly two-player games and post them in the forums, um, it's it doesn't get as much testing and feedback as single player games so it's it's always good to have like say a two player and a single player mode for games i mean some some games you just have to make two player humans because the ai is just too hard to make mm -hmm. uh for that game this is like more complex game where there's a lot of movement and strategy exactly um but it's it's smart that you included a single player and two players in this game Definitely. um so with this being your second Atari 7800 game and and subsequent 7800 games, um, will you ever consider going back to the 2600? Or are you like fanboy for life on the 7800 now? I'll see, like I said, when I kind of you know, made a little like internal promise to myself to do a trilogy, I had kind of the, the three genres of games kind of yeah. kind of planned out. Um, the 700, again, I... I it fit really nicely, but I, I, I have been doing a lot of thinking, going back to 2600, trying to port or learn some other platforms, um, you know, and again, like I said, like one one idea I had was like, you know, okay, how many how many systems can I port Dragon's Descent to? Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. You yeah. know, uh, but that that said, I mean, I don't know, it, it, I keep coming back to 700. It's, it, again, partially because, I mean, the amazing amount of homebrew coming out for it, notwithstanding, it you know it felt like it never quite got the fair shake it had. It's yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's also like coming into its own now. It's it's exploding now, which is great. It's you know slightly older than the NES, which also means it has a bit of an archaic you know a bit of an archaic tint to it, which is which is alluring. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if I make a platformer for the NES, I mean that's going to be one of hundreds. Um, if I make a, a, yeah. a puzzle drop game, or heck, even a platformer, I can count the number of platformers in the Civil 800 on one hand. Um, it's very few, and I love platformers, so whenever a platformer comes up, I'm like, oh my god, 
a platformer for the 7800. Exactly. It's great. You know, and, and it's, it's one of those ones where, like, yeah, it's it's powerful enough that you can have fun with it, but, um, but, but you know, it, it has that, that, that vintage allure. Like, you know, it, it's, you know, yeah. old enough. And again, kind of its obscurity is is also a bit of a selling point, of, weirdly. You know, all... It, yeah. Your game can't be obsolete if, if, if it get get obsolete if it's, <laughs> if it's already an obsolete platform. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, smart thinking there. Yeah, and, and you do get you would get a little bit more attention on the seventy eight hundred because there are so many gaps that that can be filled uh, with games that just don't exist or there's mm -hmm. a lack of them. And 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 to that point, um, you oh, is it not changing? What not changing? Oh, oh, whenever the button doesn't work, let me know because there's something. It was entirely my dumbness. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all your games Personal are not necessarily. They're kind of in between. Well, a lot of them are original games, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this one is still is original, but it, it's a play off of of, yeah. of other games. Um, are are do you specifically look to create original games? Or would you ever consider like doing a port? Because I know there's there's usually a, a divide between mm -hmm. developers. There's usually people who do all ports, and there's people who do all originals, and they don't cross over very much in in general. I generally like to make my own, you know, to make original work. Again, this this Dragon's Cash is kind of like, okay, what if I do a port? Is that, um, you know, how how what's that experience going to be like? I also I do have an incredible amount of respect for the people who do ports. I love watching the, the development threads where people look through and like dissect a game. You know, like, like the Popeye thread was great. Seeing yeah. like, okay, yeah, the, the control works oh, yeah. this way. No, they're using this palette here. And, and so, <laughs> again, not to say anything against people who are doing ports because there's some amazing work done there. But I, yeah. I do like taking paths, not travels. I like making you know new things. I think again. If, I have some ideas for on the 2600. Um, I picked up some old peripherals, like not only the paddle control, but the driving controller, which again is totally limited. It does yes. full 360. And, um, but again, these are it's, all it, fairly large, you know, developed games. But I wanted to make a couple like 4K games that are just like simple little things for the 2600. Um, yeah. So that would be good. And then trying playing with peripherals and things like that. So, you know, I have ideas yeah, and that... platforms. The driving controller is definitely underused, and I think it has a lot of potential for a lot of games. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's, you know, things like that, when you just, like, you know, haven't really made a proper, like, 4K-only Atari 2600 game, um, and I have a couple ideas there, you know, you know, scoping it, and yeah, just having, you know, I have a lot of ideas, and just it's just, you know, these last... You know, last few games on the 700, yeah, it's been fun to develop for. I, I have, have everything in my head. I'm familiar with it. And, um, but yeah, I'll see where it goes. I I have, I've been teasing folks a little bit, but, um, you know, I have the, the Dragon's Trilogy for the 700, but I, I have a title for what an RPG would be um, if I wanted to make a full-on, like, ah. a, 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 I think the tennis title would be Dragon's Verse. Um, <laughs> but then, yeah. Another like, dragon game. Another job. <laughs> Role playing, you know, fantasy world with dragons. I, I don't know. It's, I, that's I know I, I, that's out there, but um, but yeah, that's the <laughs> but yeah, no, an RPG where you have a, a dragon protagonist and you know try to kind of at least start with this idea of a Final Fantasy or Dragon Warrior or Ultima type game on the Civilian. Yeah, that'd be game. great. I know people are working on on some really neat stuff. Uh, where's the, the um, you know already our stuff already, but yeah, that's kind of you know. I like, got yeah. something that feels like the seventy hundred is perfectly capable of doing it, but and it's been underrepresented. It is, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we need more RPGs on the seventy eight hundred. That's for sure. It's more than capable of doing it. And and to your point of um, ports versus original, there is that added scrutiny when you do a port <laughs> uh, and criticism if you step outside the bounds of what the arcade or the original game was and take some artistic license, or even like make compromises for the system that it's on that you're kind of almost forced to make compromises. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, right. you know, it doesn't have the right pixel width. I had to, you know, reduce this down and the height is not right. And I only have this many sprites, so I can't, you know, put 30 characters on the screen. I had to put it down to 20. 
uh, and the colors, oh my god, people get really critical about the colors, and colors in the 7800 are quite a thing. Uh -huh. um, there is no proper colors on the never, 7800. It just outputs what it wants, really. That combined with, uh, you know, NTSC, never the same color. Uh, <laughs> yes. That form. I, I'm really curious to see what Harpy's Curse looks like. I was I just did some last second testing on <laughs> on, on the CRT next yeah. to my computer, um, and I was like, okay, this looks different than what I've been on my computer, and I have no idea what it's going to look like on zero page. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I try my best to kind of mimic the emulators because people are people test and use the emulators to develop their games. So I think that's the the safest mm -hmm. thing that I can mirror. Uh, in terms of colors for the 7800, and I, I have to keep adjusting it all the time. Um, uh, Muddy Funster says, that's why I prefer to do adaptions yeah. rather than ports. So not claim to make an exact duplicate of the game, it's like, well, I'm I'm making a version exactly. of the game for the 7800. Yeah. And there's people, people will still compare it, of course. Of course, but I, well, that, yeah, you're right. There's, there is kind of, a, there is that challenge of like, how close can I make the arcade port on a different machine that you know, really wouldn't, shouldn't be capable of doing it, or, you know, you can't do a one-to-one <laughs> yeah. -one for, even just the aspect ratio, like, we need to turn our TVs on our sides yes. for a lot of, for a lot of these. Um, yeah, and, uh, I don't, I think I mentioned that in the last show, that, uh, yeah, you don't see that too much, because it's a big pain in the ass to turn TV sideways. Most people's TVs that are mounted on the wall or sitting on something, mm -hmm. uh, they don't they don't really prepare to do no. uh, a Tate mode and rotate the, rotate their screen. None of my screens are ready to rotate except for my maybe my desktop, but not even right. then. So it's it's a bit dangerous. Other than Merlin's Walls, I think that's the only right. rotatable <laughs> twenty six hundred game. Um, well, that's just just because it's a special game. Yeah, crap. But yeah, the, the I mean, yeah, doing the I mean. There are a lot of fun games, and it's also going to take one that exists and put your own spin on it, certainly, you know, and, and adapting it, you know. Yeah. That's, I think, like, the battle mode in Dragon's Cash is kind of my little thing of, like, okay, columns, but something else, yeah. something a little extra. Yeah. And, and I love it when people extend original games to something that's not, that was not in the original, but makes it amazing, like a lot of champ games adds a second player into Galaga, or a second player into a, another game. It's like, whoa, two players in Galaga at the yeah. same time. This is awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's great. And uh, VHZC says, I don't like porting stuff, because for me, the design of the game is one of the fun parts. Yeah, and obviously you, you enjoy designing games from scratch and coming up with your own ideas, and power-ups, and uh, bo bosses and enemies and yeah the design dynamics are fun you know like the you know even in dragon's descent you know trying to get that balance of i need to get deeper in the maze what are the tensions dragon's havoc is well, when we get to it yeah it's, there's very much the like two opposing Situation. goals that you have playing um Whew. design also i mean Safe the thing is the it, it takes longer that was <laughs> one part of yeah. uh, of cash what dragon's cash was like Okay, if I didn't have to spend, you know, a bunch of time looking at a blank sheet of paper, Ready. I could just kind of start <laughs> immediately. Um, what is that going to? What would that feel like? And it was, it was, it was a fun experience. I'm glad I did it. But then, yeah, I, I think my my general tendency is to I is to make original games. But again, it it's, yeah. takes all kinds. And you know, if if people only played the exactly. kind of games I like to play, I don't think there'd be many happy gamers <laughs> out there. No, and it, it's great to have the diversity of the people who really concentrate on ports and concentrate on people who concentrate on originals. I, I love original games, and I love ports, mm -hmm. because original games, it's like, oh, this is a brand new use of the 2600 or 7800, or mm -hmm. I never thought it could do this, because if you're porting an arcade game, you're, you're pretty much sticking to what happens in the arcade game, and you may not be exploring something that a 7800 can do because it can save games right. and you can have rpgs that you know don't exist in the arcade world yeah mm -hmm. um so here is uh dragon's havoc uh which the box art just got released yesterday so congratulations on that maybe you can speak a bit to the uh the box art who did it because it looks i couldn't make out the signature and um, oh, that's that's ben again yeah, yeah ben and shepherd um oh uh, great no, no, it's uh, cabbage on the forums, but yeah, the uh, no, he, he did he did a great job as always, um, and was you know it was also just I mean probably would still be we'd probably still be waiting for it to be released if, if he didn't step up and, and do the the box art and manual, um, 
Tony Martin stuff. But yeah, I think the manual also looks amazing. Um, so for when people get to hold it in their hands, that's something to look forward to. Yeah, to have that physical release, that physical item, it, it just feels... It feels a bit more real, right? It feels nostalgic. It feels like I've I've made something, um, and and I knew that I, I felt that when I, you know, I made my film. Um, I mean, that's it's kind of the end of an era for physical media, unfortunately, in terms of movies. So I'm like, right. oh, okay, this might be the last movie <laughs> I ever have on a Blu-ray. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm really happy yeah. that I could, and and you must get that same feeling, having it, you know, sitting at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo in the Atari Age booth and people picking it up and, and buying it, taking it home and seeing it on people's shelves if they take a picture of it. Yeah. That's, that's a draw for me and that has to be a draw for, for so many people who are so many home brewers, whether or not they want to admit it, yeah. but yeah, it's a big, it's a big thing. Okay. It is, like making the game is, is awesome and completing it and people enjoying it, but the, the physicality of it is is something else. It is something different. Um, so, um, in your lineup of games, you have a shmup now, uh, a light RPG, a puzzle game, and a racing game. Is that something that uh, you strove to do, to, to have diversity, to challenge yourself? I, I like all these genres. and. Yeah, no, I think that was, I mean, I, I wanted to do a couple, I mean, many different kinds of games. And again, the scope meant that, like, you know, if yeah, again, I hadn't really done a puzzle game, but, you know, and... But, yeah, if I decided to quit, it, you know, was a small... What would have been a... If I could finish it, and... I think, you know, a lot of it is, yeah, these are exercises or practice. Um, you know, I... Yeah. Game design in general, and I have, you know, certain games that I like to, to design more than others, but this allowed me to kind of branch out and, you know, see how well I could do. Yeah, if I want to make a racing game, yeah, I... I, I think drag... I think as simple as it is, I think Dragon Racer, you have... Enough that tension of like if you're ahead you can't fire backwards so you're you're vulnerable but you want to uh, win yes. so you have to you want to get ahead and <laughs> there's enough tension to kind it of make this out nicely yeah you know there there's the I mean what's known as like negative feedback where if, if a system tries to move too much out of equilibrium forces will kind of try to push it back and a lot of good game design is about that yeah. about you know if somebody is trying to move ahead you try to make design forces to kind of push things back or you know have them fight you know have you kind of wrestling with that um, yeah and and speaking of um equilibrium and uh <laughs> in this game you have a, a, a fairly unique system of power-ups mm -hmm. uh that, that people can see on the if they haven't played it at the top of the screen you have the power-up meter and it increases every time you successfully hit somebody mm -hmm. and when you get hit the power meter goes down but the power meter dictates not only like the speed your speed, but the power and speed of your shots, and uh, it, I found it very unique and very, it changes the way you play the game. You're not haphazardly firing, because if you fire Ooh. and miss, it also goes down too. Mm -hmm. So it becomes less, I don't know, of a shmup, a more of a, a little bit of strategy in there, a strategy game, where you're not just holding down the button and it's got rapid fire. Right. So maybe talk a little bit about the decision to make it a little bit more strategy of a shooter. I think, yeah, a lot of this was, I mean, I do like shmups, um, you know, like taking them, and yeah, I was kind of, one of the things that in design, I'm like, okay, if I, if there's a button in the game, not only, like, what does it do when I press it, but why do I need to not press it? I don't know what happened there. You know. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, if you get hit, your power meter goes to zero, and if you get hit again, you're dead. If you miss, your power meter goes down. So you want to place your shots very carefully. And your shots go so slow that you can't shoot again. It, that's what actually happens. I thought, oh, yes. I'll kill this guy, he's been hit. But then I didn't shoot. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Every, everything slows down when you it's miss. It's not your hit. fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you get sorry, hit, sorry, if you get hit with the shield, you're also invincible for a good second or two. And I use that use uh, that to get out of dodge. You use that to, uh, to get out of the way of the thing that, that just hit you. Uh, yeah, because there's games where it's cheap, and it's like, oh, I got hit, uh, my power went down or my shields went down, but there's no time time delay between when you can get hit again, and it's just, you're dead immediately. Like, you, the guy can hit you, like, five times in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's always nice to have that, like, 
don't know, characters flashing a bit before you can get hit it, again. Right. Well, and this is the... But yeah, the, the dynamic here is, yeah, if, you know, you need to put a reason not to press a button. Because a lot of shmups, you can just put a piece of scotch tape over it and just hold it down, and, and then you're just maneuvering. <laughs> um, and I kind of like just the emotional, like, you know, during the middle of the game, you're, you get into the point where you're like, Rah! you know, you're... You get yeah. kind of, and I wanted it to play through because that happens in schmucks as much as any, you know, if not more than most other genres. But I wanted to kind of have a thing yeah. where if you do that, you're kind of rewarded because, yeah, you're, you are more powerful, but then suddenly you get reckless, and bad things happen when you get reckless. Yeah. So you, you kind of need to, like, no, I need to focus here, you know, and the more powerful you are, the harder that is to maintain. You get, you move faster, <laughs> you yes. shoot faster, so it's easier to miss and easier to run into things. Um, yes, yeah, exactly. Like um, you can see, the enemies and their f their their shots are quite slow in the game, as opposed to other shooters. Like we just played 1942 on the stream the other day uh, for the 7800, and everything's it's a full screen of bullets and enemies, and they're all flying fast. You're dodging like crazy. This is a slower paced, more strategic. You place your shots. You move out of the way of shots. Um, it changed the dynamic of the game, and people just picking up and playing this would be like, "What? What? What? What's going <laughs> on? This is very different." And it's it's great that you make original games like this and are able to put those new ideas. Because uh, maybe there's another game like this out there. I don't know of a shmup that's a strategy shmup. <laughs> I guess I mean, if I could call it that. Some some more than some are more than, some are more thinking you know thinking person shmups than others. But yeah, this was and again wanted to have it a little more than just yeah you know random right your dough, hold down the button and, and shoot. And and a part of it is also the slow pace. Is it because I hit the, the wall that I? It's part, partially oh, do you hit in those, if, if you hit the wall, is it? Uh, I think you do get. Yeah, uh, you want it, You don't want to touch the wall. Murderized. Punished. Yeah. So get out of the wall. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah. So you're back back to the walls again in this in this game. So just like Dragon's Descent, stay away from the walls, which which is a pretty common thing in um, shooters is don't touch the walls. Yeah. At least in this one, you can really tell what's a wall and what's not a wall. Mm -hmm. In some snaps, <laughs> I'm like, can I can I touch that? I don't know if I can touch that part or not. Uh, am I going to die? <laughs> and um, uh, and great, great parallax in this as well. That was a lot of fun to do. That was kind of my big, like, you know, okay, can, I know, the way this many hundred is done, it's actually, it'd be easy, it's easier to do, I think, than on like something like the NES, because the Sony Hunter doesn't really have a tile map as such. It actually draws things row by row. So like, okay, if I shift the row, and I can change the colors, yes. so you can have a really nice range of colors and such. Um, you know, uh, I, was somebody, I think somebody in the chat pointed out, like, yeah, I, I am using, Ryan, you're using art. Um, I can kind of, I have one, I, I kind of like how the sprites look, but also the, these are in a vaguely shared universe. Those are kind of a shared universe sort of thing now. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, somebody commented on that. I, it's, it's fun, like VH said, see. Um, in his games, he re reuses a lot of his characters from other other games, and it's like, oh, there's the thing from that game, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of a cool thing you can you can look out for. Definitely. I just gotta get rid of this uh, spammer dude here. Not that they usually post twice, but yeah. <laughs> it's the there principle. We go. It's the principle yeah. of banning them, and there must be punishment to show the other spammers that aren't here. Yeah. They're just bots anyway. They're computers. Right. <laughs> Um, so, let's see, um, so what tools do you use to develop your games, such as the graphics, the sounds, the coding, the testing, what environment do you use, what emulator, hardware, things like that, to, to just yeah. briefly step us through that process? Oh, and that's, that's so much of homebrew, I guess that's, that was a weird case of, yeah, with the 2600, whenever you do homebrew for any platform, you're like, okay, I need a way to, you know... I need a good emulator to run something on. I need a development platform. I need, ideally, I need some sort of SD card or some way to test on hardware. And then I kind of need some way to actually make the physical media. And I've, a lot of platforms I had to like at least put off because one of those steps is is missing. And sometimes it's a weird step. Weirdly, I started this yeah. before the, con the the concerto came out, so I was like, I was hoping that there would be an SD oh, card. Oh boy. Um, but yeah, in terms yeah of, that was uh, a rough a rough period of time when we didn't have any way to play games on the 7800. Mm -hmm. 
It's like, well, either add some obscure cartridge that you're lucky to have, or eh, Eric, yeah, get a soldering iron and, and a you know burner, or you know, you could yeah. well. And the other thing is like this is weirdly like the, the Atari stuff. You know, I still I rely on Al to to actually make the physical media. Um, mm. But the uh, that is nice, like Atari Age, just existing yes. for an outlet for the forums. For making and putting together these games, I don't know how Al even has the time to do it, um, especially with this lineup that's coming at PRGE. But yeah. just having that person who can manage all of that and coordinate all of that is is and and even know how to do it is a huge benefit to the community. That's that's for sure. What a good publisher does. But yeah, the uh, but yeah, for for my tools, it's I mean like I. You know, I have the assembler, I think, DA, you know, um, between a DASM, which I got installed over a long profanity-filled afternoon and haven't touched since. <laughs> um, that yeah. attaches to either Batari Basic, or I found a, a good visual uh, interface for that, um, or 7800 yeah. Basic, and honestly, like, the programming agency is Notepad++, and then Rowan can probably kind of tell me what's wrong. Um, Right. Yeah. And then yeah, but that that builds it. Emulators. Um, if I really want to make sure it's working like as a 100% or close to 100% emulation, I, I use main. But I also use a buff system just because I can just double click right. and starts up quickly. It's it's a really nice emulator. It's you know it's not 100% perfect, but it's 99% perfect for you know virtually everything oh, except hardware buffs? stuff. Can you double click on a um, the program file in Bup System? It'll run it. Yeah. Right. It'll go right. Oh, I got install that. Yeah. No, it, it does. I usually use the JS seventy eight hundred, and it doesn't it doesn't work completely. Yeah, I, I run Windows, so I just associated all seventy eight hundred dot a seven eight files with Bup, and then yeah. You know, oh, and, perfect. And you can just yeah, that's close. If I can double click it and run it, so that's that's the emulator I go to, even though like. If, for instance, you know, um, Harpy's Curse, I'm like, I need to test the Atari box on, you know, I right. need to run it in MAME, I also want to check with, with the color, you know, does the color warmth look good and things like that, but I only kind of do that once I'm kind of finalizing things, um, because it's, again, it's, you know, double-clicking versus, you know, it's two clicks versus, like, eight clicks to get into a game, um, and if you're running right. through and testing stuff, every click save is, is worth it, so. Yeah, yeah, oh, somebody... Trigger treat time. Oh, I don't know why treat time's not working. It's because today. the sound is going through here, you, and it's not the same sound that we would normally hear. But they it's should hear be it out there. Did you guys hear it out there? Or <laughs> it says the VR Pokop says no treat time alarms today. Um, but uh, let's let's treat those cats. Is that okay, Tom? That's <laughs> just until my I get up to I, my cats are gonna are, are gonna uh, Go tackle me once I leave once I, after this and. Demand treats themselves. Well, we're, we're almost to the end, so you can tell your cats that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that one's excited. Nice treats. Okay. So people can just imagine the game in the background. Oh, ding, ding. Um, so, oh, um... It's funny that Bup System was created for one game. A whole yeah. <laughs> emulator was created for just one game, and it's quite the game. So I can understand that. That's for sure. That was a, that was <laughs> a machine, huh? Weirdly liberating, kind of like yeah. one thing going into the yeah. hundred. I want to make the best game I could, but I also realized early on, like I wasn't going to make the best game for the Sony hundred ever because that's arguably Ricky and Dick. That's arguably the game that. <laughs> there you go. That's a high bar. It's right. a really high bar. When you make a game that doesn't even look like it's part of the system, like it's a much more advanced uh, system that's running it. Yeah. No, that was that's that, that was. Like, I, I'll have to say that was one of the games that kind of got me at least interested in the 7800 and and kind of pulled me into the homebrew on that. Um, that was a, a factor that that yeah. contributed. Um, oh yeah, it's it's a. It's a marvel. And he created his own emulator, created his own uh, uh, audio chip, chip for it, <laughs> his own cartridge. Uh, it's it's out of the world. If any if people haven't played Ricky and Vicky, definitely go check it out. It, especially if you love platformers and puzzle platformers. Oh my yeah, god. It's not, it's not it's Steam, but yeah, it's worth looking at. It, it kind of one of those things like, you know, yeah. what does what can what is the seventy hundred capable of? Like look at this game. 
Yes. If you could push it as far as you can, the interstitial movies that it has. But anyway, that's another game and another programmer. Yeah. This is this is you today. <laughs> um, so uh, tell us a little bit about the development history of. Uh, oh, I can move, change it back now. Got to them. <laughs> of uh, uh, Dragon's Havoc, um, and what prompted you to make uh, a shooter, and uh, and also. Uh, talk a little bit about the release, not too much, because we will talk with you again in November yeah. with Atari Age Day. But uh, just a little bit about the release of this game, and its and its release, um, uh, the steps that led up to its uh, release on cartridge. I think that was. I was looking through, you know, I had Dragon's Cash kind of done, learned a lot of great things about it. You know, even it technically had a lot of kind of things I was I got, you know, familiar with like the double buffer and things. Um, I. You know, I like making shmups. They're, I find they're fun to, to program and fun to design because you can kind of take the basic idea of, you know, yeah, shoot stuff, you know, fly and shoot stuff, but then, like, shmup? add elements I mean, to I can it. guess from context. It's a... Uh, sh shoot em up That's what it's short for. Shoot em up Shoot em up Yeah. Yeah. So if you're saying it really fast, it kind of sounds like that. Sorry. No, no, that's... Uh, yeah, but, you know, but that, you know <laughs> in, in, you know, long lines of radius and R-type and such, but... And yep. I had an old, like, uh, way back, I remember, I thought I was learning, like, to program on DOS. Um, I found a neat little, like, way of doing scrolling that where um, you, you really need a, a screen's worth of memory to do it in. Screen's worth of memory plus a little extra. Um, yes. And so I'm like, okay, let's try if we can actually get scrolling on this working on the 700. And I got kind of a, a, that engine working. Um, and again, if I was going to do a platform, I'd have to do things like, you know, complicated collision detection and stuff, so I'm like, okay, I just have the scrolling, let's do a shmup, and then like, oh, right, because of the way this engine works, I can do parallax. Um, so let's yes. make a parallax engine. And then I could either do parallax or I could do like a tile map, but I, at least at that point, okay. I, could, I, am, you know, I couldn't really do both at the same time. But like, okay, well, we'll have a parallax level, and then a tiled level, and then a boss, and I think right. things came together. And I had the, the rage, like, havoc mechanic where you... I had that was going on for a couple years now. It was it was an idea I had for a game ah. that again never I never really completed. Made a lot of prototypes, but they were either you know modern platforms, and I was always like always need to do war. I need to hang on. So I'm like, no, let's 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 do this for seven hundred. Let's get this finished. Yeah. Um, oh, that's great. And, and uh, two um, players and, at once. And it's uh, yes, two players at once. Sorry, I can't play, it, play no. the uh, second player on any of these games, but yeah. uh, believe us, there there are two players on this game, and it is a lot of fun. And we did play it on the show before with two players uh, um, earlier. Um, let's see. Okay, well, let's. Uh, oh yeah, if you want to speak to a little bit about its um, oh. its release, or maybe we can see oh, no, that. The, or, I don't know. I think I mean, part of it was yeah, we you know getting the manual and stuff. Uh, ready over the summer you know i had it largely the software is largely finished um last spring you know i was testing it and, and making uh, you know adjustments and stuff but a lot of it is i think kind of learning i also want to learn like how do you finish a game not just the software but yeah we need you know you need a box you need a manual you kind of need to promote it and and publish it that, yeah. which is a whole experience and you know and it's it's a skill you need to practice like any other so this it's been fun working with al working with ben um Getting this together, um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to see. Looking forward to see how 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 folks like it once we get to Portland. Yeah, and you're gonna be in Portland. That's the. This year, I've got plans. No. I have tickets booked. So yeah, that's the, excellent. That's great. So we'll run into you there. Darcy is mad at this game. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll we'll talk with you there as well and get you on camera. To, um, you know, talking about your release. Um, so let's go. To Harpy's Curse. Yeah. Yeah, Darcy says. So, I'm sick of winning this game. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the exclusive world premiere. I'm going to play the uh, little jingle here. So, <laughs> I'm going to turn this off first. So, here we go. It's the exclusive world premiere of <laughs> Harpy's Curse. Excuse me. Exclusive world premiere. Are you ready, Darcy? 
He's... I'm never gonna. Be, I can never be ready enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ready. We go. Let me change out the cartridge to my password. Custom cartridge. So we've got the uh, main Check menu here. Gone. Harpy's Curse. We've got new game controls. Music off. That's uh, right now. There's tent music. I'm. I might try getting something together for Portland. Um, I'm yep. also kind of. And this is going to be on display at PRG. That's the um, that's the plan. I'm, I'm working awesome. like we're working like mad the last two weeks to get something ready for you guys, and then trying to do some yeah. see see what happens actually how it plays and, and do some fixes no for uh, for Al. So fingers crossed it sh it should show up at, at Portland. Uh, oh, excellent! So people will be able to play this themselves. <laughs> that's excellent. But yeah, the music. Um, um, during the music, I, I'm I might do uh, TIA music, but I'm looking at seeing what we okay. involved to do Pokey or Pokey compatible stuff. But that's excellent. that's going to be a, a that's going to be not right now, but a, a tentative future for, for the project. So let's go into the controls, and you can explain um, yeah. the different controls. Um, yeah, but part of it's how it feels comfy. I mean, weirdly, it's it feels more comfortable swapped for me on the on the Pro Line joystick, but. Um, you can jump, which is also flying, and then you have an attack button yep. or attack mode, which means you swoop, you you dash diagonally downward. Um, so right. you can two button joystick means one jumps, one attacks. Or if you have a single button Atari joystick, or honestly, it might be more comfortable on the on the pro line after for a long play. If you hold down and jump, you'll you'll do a you'll do a swoop. Oh, okay. You probably want one of the two button ones. Not the one button. Yeah, you, you're so whichever one you want to jump. And yeah, you might you Attack might want to see one. how how it plays either way. Okay, so uh, let's jump into it and take a look. Go for it. New game. So tell us about this game. Nobody's seen it. Nobody's seen it. Neither have I. I. I tested it, but I didn't really play it too much. Yeah, no, it's... So what's... What, what What prompted this? What's the history behind the game? You know, I had a good scrolling engine. Um, you know, a good code for scrolling in, you know, with Sim 800. Um, and the little harpy character I kind of ended up making for uh, for Dragon's Havoc, I'm like, hey, there's a character in here. And then somebody thought of, like, okay, you know what? What games aren't on the 7800? There isn't. Hasn't really been a Metroidvania. Um, yes. And so, yeah, I'm. I was kind of like, okay, what? You know. And but that said, like trying to design around like jump puzzles. I mean, you can do it, but like, what if you just make Joust? Joust meets Metroid. I feel like that's a pitch that people, that retro enthusiasts would there, like. There you go. Your elevator pitch. <laughs> exactly. So this is. Yeah, so um, you, you start, too. you know, yeah, you explore, you're, you're looking for, there's four bosses you need to defeat before unlocking the final boss. You can collect power-ups, uh, like, I hard jump. containers. So is this button two, then? Uh, whichever button is, you want to Which, change which is it? button one? I don't know, that one? Yeah, you can, you also can, that's uh, jump right now. auto fires on, so yeah, you can just hold it down. Um, but what about attack? Oh, uh, and you yeah, need to be in the air. air. So, hold it, while in the air, just, yeah. Press okay, the attack. so this is button one, this is button two. Though. Do you want to switch them? It's fine. Okay, it's good. You need to know what they are. Sorry about that. <laughs> Controls. No, 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 I just wanted to make sure I didn't misunderstand the rules, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, so you can't really jump into character you know, enemies, you need to swoop to attack them. There you go. There you go. Oh, and it gave a heart when you defeated yeah. it. Yeah. So that was, again, what design wise, like, I need, you, the enemies are there, you know, getting rid of them is nice, but I kind of wanted to give it an incentive beyond that. Um, yeah, there's, yeah. And there's no, that's the thing, this is an oddity for a, you know, a lot of my games, there, there's no score, which, what's a video oh. game without score? Um, there's, there's, you know, this is more like a, you know, this is more like a, you know, NES or Sega Master System game than like an arcade game, you know, an arcade board. Right. Goal oriented right. rather than um, uh, point oriented, because there are some games that hide the score. But this isn't one of them. There is no, there's like absolutely no score in this game, yeah. and no plans for score. No, okay. it'd be interesting and to that's, see. And that's that's fine. Yeah. Fine for me because I, I usually in games where there's levels and there's you know different levels and there's an end. I'm like, oh, I just want to get to the end. I want to see how far I can get in the game, and the score is irrelevant unless there's a high score challenge. Then then it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, this is a, yeah. It's it's 
the one reason I think also, like, looking at gaming history, they talk about the great game crash of 82 to 84, which, I mean, how yeah. big it, or how small it was is debatable, but I also found that was an interesting transition of, you know, there was kind of the arcade game scene, and but then, like, when you got to home consoles, people were realizing, you don't need... Games don't have to be like arcade games, especially at home. So you've yeah. got, like... You know, I think a lot of it was coincidental, but like with the NES and with a lot of that coming in, you had games, you know, like, you could have a game like Final Fantasy that would take 40 hours to complete. Um, right. Which yeah. is a different design consideration than, you know, than pac -Man. And not saying one is better or worse than the other, but that's just, a, a, again, a path to take. Yeah, and, and it did change the landscape of, you know, home, home consoles and home computers the way people thought about games. Mm -hmm. They weren't just disposable. Yeah, game over, man. Killed me. It did kill you. <laughs> um, I noticed when I was um, just trying out this game mm -hmm. on, on my system that when you attack and you miss, and say you're at the top of a very large column... You're committed. ...that it just... You're committed to that attack. Like, it'll take you all the way down. And, and I was wondering if that was uh, uh, by design. Like, you... You definitely meant to do that, and there's no timeout to the attack. I want to see how well that works. I want some level of commitment, um, but yeah, over across multiple yeah. screens might be a little much. There are power-ups <laughs> that change how you can attack later on, so it does give you some uh, okay. incentive. Um, there's one that there's one that will give you basically a forward dash attack, and one that will give you an up dash. Um, the the only thing I noticed that's a problem is that, like, are the are the enemies' hit points persistent when you leave the screen? Because if you like, leave the screen, I... no, like they'll reset okay. once you leave the screen. So yeah. you got to so be it's, careful. It's tricky. You, if they're at the top, you can't attack them until they come lower. Oh, because you will yes. go above the screen. You'll you'll flap up above the screen when you attack. You come down, but, but then they it reset. Also, also makes it easy to avoid them because they're at the top and you can just go under them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're low on points, you, you low on um, hit points. You uh, you want to get the heart from them too, so sometimes you don't want to avoid them. Um, so where um, so talk about a little bit about um, some of the goals, the end goals for this game, and how big of a scope it is, and like like you said, there's four bosses you need to defeat. Yeah, there, there's four that you need to defeat, then and then a final boss. Uh, so yeah, five total. Okay. Um, so it's like. But all of my previous and other games are kind of stock ROM size, 48K, TS sound chip, you know, which means, um, which I, I like to think I made work, at least, you know, like the music and stuff. Um, with the additional hundreds of things that you can actually do more with the TS sound chip than the 26 But, um, yeah. this one, like, okay, but yeah, you can figure it out. So this is a hundred, this is a 128K cartridge with, I, I got off okay. with an extra 16K of RAM. Um, you know, and, get, and said, okay, yeah, how, you know, and so if I make a venture Bainy game, yeah, how big can I make it? Um, and so, yeah, this is, at least right now, it's 512 screens worth. Like, oh, wow, okay. It's 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 a big game. I mean, that, I also, um, again, I, I guess now that there's kind of alternatives to the Pokey chip, um, you know, or Pokey compatible things like the Pokey one or the, um, you know, I was looking at like what would be involved there. Uh, that's the CK of RAM I haven't actually touched yet. I'm kind of reserving that for for audio that I might need. Um, and right, uh, right. But actually, like even the level size, I'm comfortably in there. I could I could probably add more, but I think I might not need to. Like I, I'm happy with the level size at least right now. We'll see how folks think of it when they start playing. Um, yeah, like it's working bigger, and working multi bank, which is its own challenge design where um, you know. You know, on the Atari, the 2600, you, no matter how big you make the cartridge, you can only access four kilobytes at a time. And the 700 yeah. a little more complicated and a little bigger, but same kind of challenges. Um, oh, uh, let's speak to this. Uh, Darcy made yeah. it to a password. Um, so this is like a lot of password screens you see on like the NES or something, mm -hmm. where it's not a not a scrolling down and change letters and numbers. It's a, a visual password. So what what does this password system do? Does it remember all your hit points and where you are 
What's what's encoded in this? Whenever you touch one of these, your hit points are filled, so you don't have to remember that. But it does remember all the items you've collected and where you. This this is effectively a checkpoint. So if you input that password, you will start here. Um, with and okay. if you've collected so anything. Is is this saying I have a key and a heart? <laughs> because I saw a heart and I saw a lock, but I didn't remember picking up a key. And the heart was no. These are no. Th th these are symbols. This is more of the, the password. If you go to the, the title screen, you can in input these in. Um, instead of numbers, okay, they go cool. like yeah. The, the sphere, uh, feathers of the other symbol. So you can input those. I took a took a cue from uh, the Castlevania games, like two and three in particular. Um, mm. This is so it'll 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 remember. In this case, where I don't have anything, it'll remember where I am. Yes. So if you input yeah. this password, you'll start, yeah, in the in the kind of the brick area, which is where you work at. Um, but yeah, this is... Oh, yes. Yeah. So, Ivory Tower Collection said it exactly the same time as uh, you did, uh, like the Castlevania games mm -hmm. uh, passwords, yeah. Yeah, and this is the... It's big enough, you know, this... I I think if you know exactly where everything is, I'm curious, a speedrunner could probably do it pretty quickly, but that would take a while mm -hmm. to find everything out, and... I am planning to do Atari Box save support, um, but it was also like, like, in terms of stuff I need to remember, I'm like, that's not a whole lot of data, so I can probably just have a password that will produce it. Uh, okay, and and that opens it up for people who don't happen to have an Atari Box as well, because not everybody has it. They're very popular, yeah. obviously, because they they talk and oh, they can put in the password. We'll I think I you'll do it. If you continue, I think you'll start there anyway. But um... oh, and you can get back to the past. Is this the latest password that yeah. it remembers? Oh, that's nice. Yep. So you don't have to write it down. Write it down in the moment. That's a very nice add-on, actually. Yeah. Really, really good. Um, so you're talking about the screen's uh, map size before. Mm -hmm. Now, is it all one continuous big open map, or are there like levels? There's basic. It's basically one big continuous open map. It. Ooh. I call it a Metroidvania, yes. but I don't do as much like gating. Like I don't. There are very few places where you need an ability to get to. Um, a lot of Metroidvanias are like, oh, I need to do, I need to collect this like, you know, there's a thing I need to jump over, so I need to get the high jump to jump over it, and that opens up this whole other area, which is a valid approach. But this one, I'm kind of, I designed it so that you can kind of get anywhere. Um, but all the power-ups are just really, really nice to have. And I mean, good luck fighting the bosses if you don't have any of the power-ups. Uh, <laughs> right. So it, you okay. know. As it should be. I mean, that you want the people to explore the game and get the power-ups and not necessarily be able to defeat the bosses so easily without the power-ups. You want exploration in the game. Right. So again, if you're a speedrunner, you know, you can make a beeline to all the power, you know, bosses. And if you're good enough, I think you could do it. But yeah, there's, you know, um, again, it was just, it was a, a subtle attack on, um, on how open I decided to make the map. Um, yeah, one of these. I, I think after a little while, I might eventually try to uh, make like a full on like pulled out map or something that has all the places and locations. But I mean, that's Ooh, that's nice. that's the game. So I mean, that's that. Yeah, that would be major spoilers. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a lot of spoilers. So what what is in the uh, this demo right now? This uh, that you put in. Um, really, I think. I mean, again, I want to see how folks play um, and what they think of it. But I mean. Yeah. Uh, all the levels in there, I probably need to populate and, and adjust some of the settings, add, maybe add a few more enemies in places, change some of the colors. Um, each, like, section, for, like, a uh, horizontal section of eight screens um, can have its own color palette, and the enemies have their own, can have their own color palette. I started with the default, but I, I want to switch that up. But yeah, the, the, all the yeah. items are in there. All the Most, if not all, the checkpoints are in there. All the bosses are in oh, there. Great. You can technically win this build. Um... Oh, it's, really? There's not much of an ending, but you can <laughs> defeat all four bosses, uh, go to where the final boss is, defeat the final boss. Um, the bosses themselves need a lot of work and need a lot of the paper adjustment, but, um, but yeah, this is this is a fully playable game. Um, oh, wow. I didn't know you are that far uh, into making this game. That's uh, that's awesome. And that's the it, one uh, of the issues with Metroidvania is that also, like, since the way this is ending, I couldn't really make, like, level one and then finish level one and then make level two. I kind of do, yeah, do it all at once. Have to do all at once. Yeah, that's that's true. I guess you could lock off certain areas right. that are just blank space and have no 
look to them or maze or anything, but, but why not? It's just easier to kill three of them than it is to kill one. Oh, can you like kill multiple at the same time? I don't know why. Or you just attack, attack, I'm less attack, fearless attack. of three than I am one. <laughs> uh, sorry, more, I am less afraid of less three of than I am of one. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the arc of the flying, it's a little bit like flappy birds, like very <laughs> well, it's a, big flap. It's a semi-flightless bird. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's not a dragon, apparently. Yeah, it can't coast. <laughs> uh, is, is, it, it a, is it a cockatrice? Isn't that the, the ones that can defeat the dragon? Oh, Ooh. maybe. That's cool. Yeah, it's a harpy. It's a harpy, right? Yeah. And it's cursed. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's supposed to be, I guess we beg whether, you know, the harpy is the one cursing cursing others or if the carpy is under a curse but um I, i'm writing up a little yes. uh a blurb about it but yeah basically yeah you're cursed you're in the labyrinth you need to get out um and yeah the I mean, flappy bird or i mean again like joust joust had similar controls but again yeah so that that was yeah. you're writing an ostrich um <laughs> yeah bizarre game concept yeah again <laughs> at least if it's i mean yeah again that, I, I, that makes more sense to me than a plumber attacking a gorilla but you know <laughs> Uh, it definitely does. Like, you could effectively sit on an ostrich. You could hold a lance. Uh, flying on an ostrich, that's a little bit different, yeah. <laughs> that was an odd tangent uh, of um, the myth of the, the rock, the giant bird that could pick up an elephant. There's one theory that people oh, hypothesized that. that ostriches look like baby chicks. Mm, They're kind okay. of, they have little tiny wings. They kind of have a naked that's head. Right. And, 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 you know. They kind of look like if you took, like, a, a pigeon chick and made it giant. So, like, but yeah, if an ostrich was yes. a baby chick, what does it grow into? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. If somebody theorized that it was just a miniature version of a baby <laughs> version of something, it would be a truly frightening bird right. if that's the baby. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's not... Yeah, look at the size of their eggs, too. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. too, yeah. Because people would think, oh, uh, my God, I wow. Hit those? Oh, no. Wow, that's that's quite a dangerous area there. <laughs> Going through those spikes. There's a. Uh, again, oh, sure if, if there's one hard way to get through, there's often alternative routes. Um, right. So it's something to think about. The, but <laughs> the the attacking in this very brief. Oh yeah, for sure. There's lots of ways around. It's it's neat. Yeah. 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 Uh, in the brief period that I I played, the attacking is quite quite interesting. The way it works, like you. You have to aim your attack. Um, it goes on a, a diagonal forward down trajectory. Mm -hmm. So you you're not you're not hitting downward. At least the basic, because you said yeah. there's different attacks. Right. Uh, the base attack is uh, down and to the direction you're facing. Um, so you really have to plan out and and position yourself before you start your attack. Um, and how, how are you getting used to it? Is it pretty? You're used to it now, the attacks. Yeah, it's seen. tricky, but like, it's neat. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a very different mechanic. I like it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll play with it, like maybe making a timeout or something. Although again, I'll see how. Uh, yeah, because if you miss uh, on like on, 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 on high up, it could be you're you're committed to it. But it's quite a fall. But there's not too many places where it is that big of a fall. Mm -hmm. I, I I think when I was just playing around with it, I happened to do it in this <laughs> four, three or four high chasm. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm falling. Uh, it just kept going and going till you hit the floor. And it made a sound when you hit the floor too. Mm. Um, so it's a very uh, sound rich game. You get a lot of sound feedback from everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got to turn down because we're, we're talking and stuff, but when people get to play it, um, they'll, they'll experience that. You can hear yourself touch, touch onto the ground. So that's something I want, you know, I, I have the effects in, and that's something I, again, I wish I had a little more time going in, but that's, I'll, I'm going to try to do more fine-tuning for Portland and, and later on. Um, interested in looking at what the what's involved with the pokey, and also trying to push, because yeah. they have the space and have, I should have the RAM for it, you know, even playing more of the Tia. Um, and with both of those, having, I think, between sound effects and stuff, I, I think it'll be fun, um, and hopefully add a lot, because the sound, pound for pound, sound adds so much to a game. Oh yeah, I, I would say oh. it's almost half of it. <laughs> I mean, uh, in terms of uh, feedback you get from the game, exactly. like the visual feedback is good, but without that sound, you don't you don't get the visceral 
impact of things. You don't get the satisfaction. Like this you like so this peaceful. one? <laughs> he actually likes this screen. There's no enemies. <laughs> um, you don't get the, the visceral um, feeling of defeating an enemy. Mm -hmm. Or say you, you win a level and you get the little tune. So, sound and, and music is, is such an important part of the game. So you're absolutely right. Ah! And, and choosing the right sounds or choosing Pokey over Tia. Mm -hmm. and, and actually just going back to Pokey and Tia, um, in your 7800 games, wit, no. are you using uh, <laughs> Pokey in some of them? Or is all Tia all so Tia far? All Tia so far. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, the music, music in, in all the games is, is Tia. Um, which was that's actually surprising because there's there seems to be like a a, a reverb effect in some of them like Shower really quality. really well done. That's that's how I made it. So I, again, like it's the way I I think I managed to make it work yeah. was I added a, a slight reverb or echo and that cuts off the edge that the, that Batia often has if you just do straight tones and I liken it to like singing yeah. in the shout. There's just enough <laughs> reverb that you can think you're an opera, you know. You can think you're an opera singer if you sing in the shower, and that's kind of the same <laughs> way with right. the Tia. Um, Big opera hall. Yeah, you. I I really really thought it was pokey. The yeah. the way you've added that that reverb, it's it's a, it's really really good. Hopes that the the base the 700 basic has a really good tracker and a really good sound system in there. So um, I was kind of able to okay, use yeah. those tools to leverage it. But then yeah, but then making. You know, I defined a note to, that had an echo and reverb, and again, it, it's uh, yeah. It, I I like to think we're, I always had the option to turn it off if, if it's too much for people, but I, I I think it worked out pretty well. Oh no, it has. I, I think it's it's really good. Um, so <laughs> if people haven't noticed, this is your first non-dragon game, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's still in the vein of like mythical creatures. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we talked a little bit about this, but what what draws you to these characters? Is it the just the the um, alternate worldliness of them, the ability to make them do anything, the just the look of them, the abilities? I think you know. I think a combination of all those. I kind of like this setting. Yeah, it allows a lot of kind of creative freedom. You know, if you bring in people, you know, have to make people See, look look okay on sixteen by sixteen. In pixels. this one. You attack this guy, and then the bounce, the rebound, throws you into the next screen, <laughs> and that resets the guy. So, like, you literally can't kill that one. <laughs> so, because it stays at one level, you hit him, and then and then you bounce off of him onto the next screen. And because you've left the uh, screen, he resets. And then you go back to the screen, and you yeah. hit him accidentally and die. Well, that's because I have <laughs> terrible skills at games. But like, I, I, a well, normal person would dodge. I'm just. <laughs> I'm not, well, that's a thing to watch out for. Don't, absolutely, yeah. Don't yeah. hit it yeah, when he's too high. It's just that I'm dumb, screen. so it took me this long to realize that I literally can't kill that guy. <laughs> <laughs> just avoid him. I mean, is there an advantage when you've got full hearts to even bothering with these enemies? It's mostly avoiding. No, I'm just trying yeah. to. Avoid so that's them the, that was the design question. That, like, I kind of ended up realizing I need to put enemies in here, but like, you know, why? Ha. <laughs> That <laughs> Darcy just there went across four or five screens at an angle. That's hilarious. There's a couple of scenes <laughs> in Legacy of the Wizard for the NES that you have moments like that. You're like, oh, I fell down four screens to a spike pit. And like, that's... Uh-oh. Yeah, or Prince of Persia. Yeah. You're like, ah, <laughs> spike pit. Yeah. At least you can fly in this one. Yes, that's true. Oh, maybe That's you another could... one is you kill the thing and you bounce up and so you can't get your heart anyway. Maybe if you flap, you could break out of the fall. I should That's use... a possibility. I'm sure that that does happen. Yeah, yeah. If you press the button, you can break out of a. An yeah, attack? but like when you change screens, it, I think it might interrupt what you're doing. Uh, because I don't think I yeah. intentionally dropped, or maybe I just gave up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, I'm dying. I'm gonna fall to, this, to hell, and just that's just how it is. I'm eating worms. <laughs> <laughs> Poor so me. Todd, can can you break out of an attack with a flap? Not right. Um, not right now. Wait, I think with yeah, the switch, you're, you're committed. Um, Okay. Again, yes. You, you, you know, try not to miss. But it's a choice. <laughs> try not to miss. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's once once you're attacking, it it the guy goes berserk. Mm -hmm. He just has to attack the floor or a guy, and then he'll stop stop attacking. So I might I might try adding in a little bit of a, a feedback to that, um, especially now. Yeah. Again, yeah. Seeing, seeing people play and seeing how much that might come up. Um, 
But yeah, it's one of these things like the enemies, again, kind of this... Almost incidental, because you're, what you're doing is you're trying to look for, well, both where the bosses are and, and then looking for ways to get more powerful. And the enemies are just kind of, they're obstacles in, to that end. Yeah, um, that's true. Um, Smitty asks, will this be another trilogy? Ooh. <laughs> Harpy's Curse, Harpy's Ascent, Harpy's Donation <laughs> Center? <laughs> <laughs> hey, if people like this game enough, why why not continue the character Ooh. into another, uh, another game or Harpy's Curse 2 and... Different enemies, different... Mm -hmm. are, are you opposed to making a sequel? I know a lot of developers really don't really make too many sequels, actually. I'll have to see, again, I want to see how this plays out. I have, you know, I have I have a list. I, I Every once in a while, I just will write down kind of a dozen or so, like, ideas that are, like, right on my mind of, like, my next game. Um, yeah. I don't know if, you know... Harpies are big, then I might we into it, but um, <laughs> Harpies are the new yeah. dragon. Um, that's right, that's right. You'll have to see. We'll see it. It's, it's it. The decision to what game to make next is is not always as straightforward as people think. It's mm -hmm. it's based on time and how far you get in your idea and you know your ability to do it and just a, a bunch of stuff and it's the same with any artistic endeavor it's yeah. it's not an automatic yeah i'm making a sequel it's like well you can't just make a sequel no, you... you have to have a good reason to make a sequel exactly like can i take this character further is is there more room to is there more things to do with this character or is this is this it is this the mm -hmm. pinnacle of the character yeah right no, it's, and, you know, I don't know, I, I mean, I, other things, I mean, the other creatures in the Dragon's Havoc could have, you know, uh, could, this is, could easily have been Griffin's Curse, or uh, Heritage yeah. Curse, so. Uh, <laughs> That's right. But yeah, I think the, we'll see, but no, I, I mean, I, again, I, one of the things where, like, when I animated the Harpy and stuff, and I think, you know, the little feedback, it, it was, it was charming, I, I decided to, you know, go with it, and I felt like, yeah, this, this would be a, should be a good little, uh, a good, uh, protagonist for, for Metroidvania. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I really like the look and the feel and the the type of attacks that's going on. Um, yep. So, will PRG be like the, the public debut where people are going to be able to play this, or are you going to release a demo before PRG or just after? What's the timeline? Um, I think I think that's a, I think we'll have like a, a basically a playable demo, probably very much like this one. You know, not for sale, but to be shown at PRG. Uh, yeah. I'm going to be doing again, kind of the feedback that you have here. Um, I might do some other, you know, adjust some of the sounds and stuff. But yeah, I think I'm probably going to send a copy to Al in the next couple of days. Um, so he, he can get set ready. Um, yeah. And, but yeah, but then after that, I think, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it plays out, but I want to see how it plays at, at Portland. And quite again, it'd be nice to have like a, a, a public debut there. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. see, I'll probably open up a little more, certainly for testing and stuff. This is going to need a lot of testing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a involved game. There's a lot going on. And especially games that, progress and change as you get further into the game and, and game balancing and stuff like that. It, I, <laughs> you've probably experienced it already at PRGE, but um, the fact that you can like kind of stand around your game, kind of looking at people playing it, how, how advantageous is that? That you can yeah. like literally stand there and watch them play. Mm -hmm. No, it's, you know, it's always, it's always I mean, a little nail biting, just also, you know, you're always expecting, you know, I always have a way I expect to play the game, but the moment I give it to somebody else, they'll immediately play it differently <laughs> or find that one weird bug that I would have never found on my own in a million years. So it's, I, I'm looking forward yeah. to it, but I'm also very, you know, I'm, I'm really curious to see, you know, what, um, what folks find, you know, and what, what they make of it. And yeah, again, the, even just see watching, you know, watching y'all play, um, you know, I, I'm getting, getting notes to play. Oh. Oh, what is happening? That, okay, I've run into that glitch before. I need to track that down. Okay. Well, it's correcting itself when you go over go it. Go over so it, yeah. Good. So it's, I think I yeah. kind of know what's going on, but yeah, you can. So they haven't been, I don't know. I, don't know. I didn't see what the previous one was, and this is not it, I don't think. Oh, I think well, you could go back to the, the key in the heart. Was it the, 
the I key don't want in to. the... I want to go back to where I was, James. <laughs> Uh-oh. You're screwed now. What do you, you just click the button? Well, we're pretty much finished, so it's okay. You could do the heart. No, it's the key in the heart. Yeah, but you're trying to go to a different screen than I am. <laughs> True. There you go. See? Is that there where you, you wanted to go? Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you're being very naughty. I think my cats are just as anxious as yours probably are. Mm -hmm. So we'll wrap this up. Um, so thank you so much for coming on, Todd. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and and we're looking forward to seeing you again in a couple weeks at PRGE. So if people are uh, heading out there, they can try out this game and uh, say hello to you and pick up your uh, new game as well. Which one is that? You have so many games. Uh, Dragon's Havoc. Uh oh, there's lava we just and played. spikes down there. That looks interesting. Lava and spikes. Must be something good down there. <laughs> yep. So there is. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> some good stuff down there people will have to explore it when they play exactly. it exactly <laughs> so let me just get you big full screen here there we go so thank you for coming on uh, is there anything else you wanted to uh, say or talk about before we let you go uh, no again this thank you again it was really really neat seeing you uh, watching watching you play through uh, all, all the homebrews so again thank you for this opportunity and uh, looking forward to seeing Portland yeah, you bet. So thanks for coming on, Todd. And uh, we will see you in Portland in a couple weeks. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. That was great having Todd on. I'll just say bye to him on for reals on the laptop here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so hopefully uh, everybody enjoyed us uh, stepping through the history of uh, Reventuli's games. Yeah, yeah. You had some fun playing that diverse amount of games. Yeah, and they're all good games, too. Yeah, and uh, yeah, very different each one of them too, yep. which is like which is really great. different. Yeah, like completely different <laughs> right. genres. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is nice because uh, for him developing them and uh, challenging himself each time, that's uh, that's a lot of fun. Oh, thanks, Dan. Um, hey, don't attack me. So he's not attacking you. He's trying to smush oh. his way below. <laughs> he's tunneling. My... He's a ratter or something. He's. He's meant to meant to go in tunnels. Yeah, I think. So let's just take a look at what is coming up on the show in the next little bit. One second. There we go. So we just talked with Todd. So the next show, I just arranged this like literally two minutes before the show started we're going to have the exclusive world not premiere but final version i have to change that final version of bruce lee return of fury for the atari 8-bit do you remember bruce lee for the uh commodore 64 uh you're running around you kick and there's this little green guy and a black uh ninja it's really really fun oh i think i remember yeah. yeah, yeah, and you go through little mazes and you go up ladders and stuff. It's a lot of fun. So um, we have the uh, exclusive final uh, build of that, the next show for the Atari 8-bit. Uh, that'll be on um, Kitten. You're so slippery and bad. On Tuesday. Don't listen to him. You're a good kitten. He is a good kitten. And then we have another exclusive world premiere. Not Friday. It has been moved to Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Saturday at noon. So next Saturday at noon, uh, it'll be Tanya's Saturday. Because <laughs> Darcy's here this week. Um, and so this we is the normal week that I'm here. This is the yeah. This is yeah, back last to normal. Last week was the bonus. It was a special bonus. Darcy. Bonus bonus week. Yeah. <laughs> for me, anyways. But we're back to regular. I won't. Schedule. I won't speak for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have the exclusive world premiere of Load Runner 2600. I'm really looking forward to that. And we'll also be having an interview, a live interview with Dion Olsthorn as well. Uh, that's at noon on next Saturday, not tomorrow, but next Saturday. Uh, let me bring up the chat because I can't see it here. There we go. Many dragons today, yes. Many, many dragons. Stop it, get out of here. Um, and then we're off to Portland, Retro Gaming Expo. If you're in that area, uh, we'll probably be hanging around the Atari Age booth most of the time, doing interviews, checking out the new releases. 
Um, there's a bunch of other booths there. I know Songbird is going to be there for the Lynx, so we'll go and chat with them as well. Um, and a bunch of other people. And I'll be looking for for a couple things. So we are so we are so sure in next Saturday. We are. Hey, Cone Six, welcome. Glad you can make it live. Um, and we have a meetup. It's K16. Well, K, what did I say? Cone six. Cone six. <laughs> <laughs> kind of is cone six, but it's definitely a capital O, so yeah. K16. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, K16. Oh, are you the K16? Is that, is that who you are? Come here. Oh, you're bad. Um, yep, that's a K16. Uh, well, we are at Portland Retro Gaming Expo. We're going to have a meetup there at Ground Control. The, um, no. No, no, no. At the arcade. You manage, the you manage to own cats when you want so, you want so badly for them to not do <laughs> what they want, what cats do. <laughs> I want them to do what uh, I should, want I them know, to do. I know, that's the wrong pet. <laughs> you should have a dog if that's what you want. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying, Darcy. <laughs> Yes, that's right. Um, so if you're at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, um, come to the meetup. It'll be at uh, from 8 p.m. to midnight. We're going to play some games, have some drinks, chat, wear your badge, because I don't know what you guys look like, most of you. <laughs> uh, you know what I look like, so come up to me, I guess. The same with at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Um, and I'm terrible with names, so please forgive me if I don't remember your name two seconds after you say it, because I won't. He will forgive you if you forget his name, too. Yes, I will, completely. Just call me that Twitch guy, YouTube dude. <laughs> Homebrew guy. Um, and uh, then we'll have lots more games after we come back from Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Um, and then we'll have the Atari Age Day in November sometime to coincide with all these releases uh, coming out in the Atari Age store. Uh, that are Portland Retro Gaming Expo will be November-ish sometime. Maybe I will have Al change my name tag to just say old video game guy. <laughs> that works. <laughs> that works well. You'll have to compete with uh, several other people that yeah, uh, want that. There's a lot of t people claiming that title. Yeah. So there might have to be a cage match <laughs> at Portland Retro Gaming Expo for the one badge. <laughs> the one badge to rule them all. The old video game guy. Uh, so that's a third nickname you have now. Uh, no, I don't have another nickname. I have retired collections. Just... Oh, no, it's it's me because K16 is uh, from a long time ago. Ah, uh, yes. Um... No, I don't have another nickname. It's just James, you can see. It's above my head somewhere around here. That's Darcy. Um, oh, oh, yeah, oh, no, almost. There you go, Darcy, Troy, Paul, and... <laughs> oh, I know what K-16 looks like. Are you going to Portland? Probably not. Maybe. Um, <laughs> so, thanks for tuning in. It was a lot of fun. I love doing the developer spotlights. I look back, and we haven't done one in like a year, so I need to do more of them. Um, I like to coincide them with releases of, of new games, so I'll uh, see who I can line up next. It was a lot of fun. Um, usually, I mean, Darcy or Tanya usually gets to play the games throughout, <laughs> and I chat the whole time, so Tanya usually likes it. Do you have fun? Just yeah, playing yeah, the fun. game, straight yeah. up playing? Good, good. RC70 loves them too. It's it's good for me because I don't have you coming along to like <laughs> blast away whatever <laughs> whatever I've done. Darcy gets achieved. the high score of the day. That's right on the game. But it's not so great for everyone else who would like to say <laughs> see perhaps a little more of the game than the first <laughs> level repeated over and over and over again, or the first half of the level repeated <laughs> over and over again. Well, <laughs> it's not bad. They're they're here they're here for the interview. Yeah, and and it's like a nice background Darcy provides. It's just a bunch of of color on the screen flash you keep, keep your eyes busy while you're listening <laughs> yep. that's right it's like this it's like this in front of your face <laughs> uh your prg <laughs> coverage rocks i love the on-site special videos absolute treats yeah we'll be doing um interviews at prge a little short mini interviews because there's so many people this year because it hasn't happened for three years so we're just going to be like quick five minute interviews and i'll get them lined up so i can release them really quick after I get back, it'll be pretty much like put the graphics over top, send it out. 
Um, yeah, and it's good for people who can't make it to PRG as well. So they can get a, a, a view of the Atari Age booth and see the developers and the new games as well. Um, so we will be back on Tuesday. You don't want to miss that Bruce Lee Return of Fury. It's one of my favorite games. Bruce Lee, I played it so much um, on my Commodore 64 back in the 80s. Oh my god, I love that game. It's a puzzle platformer. Less puzzly. There's a tiny bit of puzzle. More like um, straight up platformer with tons and tons of screens. And this is kind of a remix. We played of a it. version of it recently, though, right? We did okay. on the show. We yeah. did play that one. Okay. Um, but uh, it wasn't quite finished, and we found a bunch of bugs in it. And he has fixed all those bugs. And he um, said, "Oh, zero page found this, and I fixed it." And it's like, so cool. Yeah. Worked out well. I, and I love playing games on the show to, um, you know, find things like that and yeah, help, yeah. help them improve it or, you know, give feedback. Feedback's yeah, awesome. It's good to be useful. That's, it is very good to be useful. Um, me too, me too, me too. Oh, people like the PRG content. That's awesome. Okay, we are out of here. Thank you so much for watching Thrust 26 Vitoko Master KSI? K K Casey? Casey. Mm, Casey, yeah. Alan the Fur, Rendered Ghost, K16, uh, Chow Sedan and Mao, Ivory Tower Collections, uh, Revan Tooley, of course, Todd Fermansky for being an awesome guest on the show and uh, for letting us show off his brand new game. It looks on plays awesome. You guys are going to love it. So keep a watch out for it around after PRG, shortly after maybe. Um, Danny VC, Smitty B, seventy eight hundred, BR Pocock, who else? Muddy Funster, Jolt Bolt, Renard Ghost. I think I said your name. Some people get double names. So lucky. It's only because I forgot that I said it already. Um, VHZC, hey VHZC, Alina Wispangle Shipper. Quite the name. Uh. Kabuto JRM Phaser Cat Games and we're at the top so thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, we'll see you on Tuesday so oh I gotta queue up my outro there we go so uh, see you on Tuesday bye everyone say bye Darcy bye Darcy say bye cats meow, meow. they want food okay bye bye meow.